Oh, I was getting ready. Do we want to go out of order? And uh, Councilmember Tyson, would you lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We will go completely out of order. I will ask uh, my friend, Pastor Brian Williams, who is a pastor at Hope City, to come and pray with council. Welcome back to council, Pastor. Honored to be here. Uh, good to see you all. I say thank you to all you guys do for our city. Honored to be here tonight. If we would close our eyes and our head, Father, we come before you tonight on behalf of this great city and city of Columbus. And Lord, we ask you tonight for wisdom. Your word says that wisdom is a principal thing, and with all you're getting, get understanding. All the decisions that need to be made, not just tonight, but in the days ahead as we seek to see this city thrive and the residents that call this place home, we humble ourselves tonight to acknowledge you as the source of wisdom. So we welcome you into this meeting tonight. And we bring this entire city before you tonight and ask for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for blessing us. Now we will have the national anthem. Thank you. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorn's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Any person who takes any actions to obstruct or interfere with the conduct of tonight's meeting may be charged with disturbing a lawful meeting pursuant to Columbus City Code 2317.12. Any person who enters those areas of city council chambers reserved for city officials or invited guests may be charged with criminal trespass pursuant to Columbus City Code 2311.21. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorn's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. This week's communi uh, communications received by the city clerk's office are listed on the agenda and will be published in the record. Are there any other communications to be read into the record? Yes, sir. The following communication from the Franklin County Board of Elections was received on November 5th, 2021. Ms. Blevins, I hereby certify that the board has examined the part petitions for initiated charter amendment energy conservation fund received by our office from you on October 22nd, 2021. The numbers of valid and invalid signatures on the part petitions for the prospective initiative are as follows. Total signatures, 6,500. Valid signatures, 3,991. Percentage of valid signatures submitted relative to the number of total raw signatures, 61.4%. The total number of voters slash electors that participated in the 2019 general municipal election for mayor was 98,698. 
the number of electors who represent 5% of the total electors is 4,935. Please let us know if we may be of further assistance. Sincerely, Jeff Mackey, Manager, Petitions and Filings. Also, as required by Section 42-9 of the City Charter, we received a legal review memorandum regarding the Clean Energy Initiative petition dated November 8, 2021 from City Attorney Zach Klein. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Are there any resolutions to be read or announcements from my colleagues, starting with President Pro Tem? Councilmember Mitch Brown. Councilmember Dorrance. Councilmember Favor. That was, that was fast. <laughs> okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, tonight, um, I have a resolution uh, to recognize National Family Court Awareness Month. Uh, resolution 226-2021 is to declare the month of November 2021 as National Family Court Awareness Month and to recognize the Family Court Awareness Committee and one mom's battle for their ongoing efforts to raise awareness for issues within the family court system. Today, I'm honored to present this resolution to the National Family Court Awareness Committee. Family court awareness is an opportunity for survivors of domestic violence or post-separation abuse to amplify their voices while raising awareness in their own communities on the undeniable shortcomings of the family court system. The mission at Family Court Awareness is to raise awareness and shine a spotlight on one of the most important branches of our judicial system, the family court system. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Tina Swithin to accept this evening's resolution. Ms. Swithin, are you present with us? I am, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Tina Swithin. I am a family court advocate and the creator of Family Court Awareness Month. 12 years ago, I entered the family court system believing that child safety would be the priority because that just seems like common sense. Um, sadly, that is not what's happening in our present day family court system. We're in a court system where parental rights trump child safety. My own children are safe. Um, my ex-husband was labeled as abusive in our final proceedings. And, you know, while I feel very lucky that we have been protected, had the courts listened to me from day one, it would have spared my daughters and myself six years of severe trauma. Being validated in the family court system comes at a great cost. Most family court judges have no training in domestic violence or trauma. That comes as a shock to most people, um, but that's the reality across our country. And what we know about domestic violence is that it's about power and control. And that desire to maintain power and control doesn't just vanish when the relationship comes to an end. Um, it transitions into post-separation abuse and the family court system becomes the new platform um, of the abuser. And sadly, tragically, in some cases, the children become the pawns. It's very important for us to recognize and honor um, the tens of thousands of children who are sent into abusive situations every single week. A conservative estimate is 58,000 children annually. There are 111 known cases where a child has been murdered after a parent pled to the court, asked, begged the court to protect their child and the courts failed to act. And now that child has been murdered. Um, and that's just the one, the cases that we absolutely know of. Um, again, that's probably very underreported. Our children's lives are literally dependent on our family court system becoming educated on these issues. We have an absolute crisis on our hands. And we firmly believe that the first step towards change is creating awareness. So I'm grateful to Columbus, Ohio, um, for joining our list of over 220 cities and counties and eight different states across the country who have proclaimed November as Family Court Awareness Month. So thank you for standing with us 
to recognize the importance of a court system that prioritizes child safety. Thank you so much uh, for bringing this, um, this effort to Columbus City Council. You know, we just came off of the heels of uh, honoring and, and really advocating on behalf of Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And we know that domestic violence has been up uh, since the onset of the pandemic. And so this is a timely resolution to bring before uh, the city of Columbus to raise awareness uh, to the trials and tribulations that folks are experiencing as they navigate the family court system. Uh, so thank you for sharing your story this evening and thank you for advocating on behalf of families all across the country. Are there any comments by my colleagues? Well, with that, I would move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorn's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Adopted. it. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's all I have tonight. Thank you, Madam uh, Council Member. Next Council Member to come for count, uh, is Reem, Council Member Remy. Thank you very much, Council President Hardin. I have one announcement this evening. My next community hours uh, will be held tomorrow on Tuesday, November 16th from 3.30 to 5 on WebEx to RSVP. Please email my legislative assistant. Lucy Frank at ljfrank at columbus.gov. That's ljfrank at columbus.gov. Also, I'd be remiss not to uh, remind people that the um, Council Residential Districting Commission has finished and released their final uh, set of maps. Those maps can be viewed at columbus.gov slash districting commission. Again, that's columbus.gov slash districting commission. We encourage everyone to go to that site and make comments on the maps uh, before the close of those comments, which will come in December. Thank you, Council President Hardin. That's all I had this evening. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Tyson. Thank you, President Hardin. I have, um, I, I don't have a resolution this evening, but I certainly would like to to have Edward Johnson uh, from Columbus Public Health to give us an update on COVID-19 and the vaccines and, um, and especially um, to provide emphasis on the children getting the vaccines. Edward Johnson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council Member Tyson, and thank you, President Hardin. Um, pediatric vaccines are progressing incredibly well across Columbus Public Health and with our hospital and with our retail pharmacy partners. Um, we know that a lot of folks have been making appointments. Um, in addition to that, Columbus Public Health is offering walk-in hours um, at, our, at our campus at 240 Parsons Avenue. That's Monday through Friday. So on Mondays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, we're open from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And then on Tuesdays, we're open from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. Additionally, we have three community sites that we would encourage everyone uh, to attend as they're able at Linden Recreation Center on Mondays from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, at Columbus Fire Station 18 at 1630 Cleveland Avenue on Thursdays from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. and then at Westgate Recreation Center on Fridays from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, at any one of those locations, individuals can start their vaccination course. Uh, they can receive a booster shot or they could begin the vaccination course for children uh, five years of age and older. Um, we encourage everyone to get their COVID-19 vaccines as we continue to re uh, realize that individuals that are ending up with the most severe forms of illness and ending up in the hospital are those that are unvaccinated. So we do continue to encourage vaccination. Uh, additional information is available at columbus.gov forward slash C19VAX. Thank you, Council Member Tyson. Edward, could you please just share um, the success of the um, the vaccinations for our young people. I know on Saturday we had the an, 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 op, an open house, I'm sorry, open house, but um, you could walk in and get a vaccine. And uh, I think we're the, one of the only sites in the city that is giving walk-in vaccines as a, for children as opposed to um, having to, you know, contact either you're a pharmacy or you're a physician, and I have an under, and my understanding is also there may be three to four week lag time. So could you just really share the success on Saturday um, from, um, and, and as a respect to children coming? And um, yeah, just could you just share that, please? Absolutely. This past Saturday, we were able to host a uh, Saturday clinic uh, with a focus on our pediatric population that's become newly eligible. The clinic was 
from 9 a.m. to noon. Uh, at 9.35, I believe, we had to stop accepting uh, new patients and folks in line as we had completely filled up every slot that we had available for the three hours. Uh, additionally, I believe we stayed and the last vaccination occurred at about 2.30 p.m. So we know that there's incredibly high demand for pediatric vaccines to get our children vaccinated. So we encourage you to use those walk-in hours that I had mentioned throughout the week. Um, additionally, we will be looking to stand up additional Saturday hours as we understand children are in school and it may be a little less convenient to uh, bring them in during work hours. So please stay tuned to our website and we will make additional announcements as we have those Saturday weekend hours and uh, potentially late Friday hours as well to help get, get our community back to normal and get our children vaccinated. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. And that's good news to, to hear that so many parents bought their children in or family members bought their children in to get, to get the vaccine. And I also just want to share with my council members that we will certainly be coming back to you and having some discussions around um, the Vax for Cash because it has been growing quite well. And we want to continue to do that. And we want to make sure that if that is an incentive that is working, we want to continue to keep that moving so that we can make sure that families are able to continue to get their vaccines. So thank you. Thank you, Edward. That's all I have, President Harden. Thank you, Council Member. Um, are there any comments by other elected officials, uh, the auditor's uh, office or any judges or our city attorney's office represented? Hearing none. Are there any requests by members of council for the removal of an ordinance a resolution from the consent action portion of the agenda. Seeing none, may we now have a motion to waive reading of 30-day uh, legislation by the city clerk. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorns, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you. Will the clerk now read to the record orders numbers on 30-day legislation? Finance Committee, ordinances 2787, 2794, 2866, 2902, 2936, 2021. Public Safety Committee, ordinances 2891, 2928, 2960 2021. Public Utilities Committee, ordinances 2435, 2514, 2738, 2747, 2753, 2755, 2761, 2809, 2816, 2818, 2821, 2823. 2859, 2863-2021, Technology Committee, Ordinances 2417 and 2890-2021, Public Service and Transportation Committee, Ordinance 2908-2021, Economic Development Committee, 20, Ordinances 2948, 2949, 2950, 2951, 2963, 2964, 2965, 2966, 2967, 2968, 2969, 2970, and Ordinance 3005-2021. Rules and Reference Committee, Ordinances 2142, 2722, 2724, and 2725-2021. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Seeing no speakers on the first reading, uh, the following ordinance appear on our record as uh, consent. Will the clerk now read those into the record? Resolutions of Expression 228X and 229X-2021. Finance Committee, Ordinances 2626, 2676, 2683, 2690, 2772, 2786, 2791, 2867, 2876 2021 Recreation and Parks, Ordinance 2513-2021, Public Safety Committee, Ordinances 2780, 2796, and 2894-2021, Public Utilities Committee, Ordinances 2712, just 2712-2021, Neighborhoods Committee, Ordinance 2837-2021, Technology Committee, Ordinances 2765 and 2942, 2021 Public Service and Transportation Committee ordinances 2745 2785 2798 2803 2813 and 2861 2021 Housing Committee 
ordinances 2719, 2754, 2805, 2877, and 2977 2021. Criminal Justice and Judiciary Committee ordinances 2709, 2740, 2878 2021. Economic Development Committee ordinance 2864 2021. Administration Committee ordinance 2732 2021. And Health and Human Services Committee ordinances 2788, 2920, 2922, 2971. 2972-2021 and rules and reference committee ordinance 3022-2021 and i'm sorry appointments from the mayor's office a0195 196 197 198 199 200 201 203 204 205 206 and 207 2021 thank you madam clerk are there any questions or comments from the consent portion of the agenda Seeing none, may I have a motion to uh, pass uh, for passage by voice? Clerk, please call the roll by voice. Ms. Brown? Yes, with the exception of 64-2021, on which I'm abstaining. Mr. Brown? Yes. Doran, Mr. Dorrance? Yes. Ms. Favor? Yes, with the exception of 2754-2021, for which I'm abstaining. Um, Mr. Remy? Yes. Ms. Tyson? Yes, with the exception of 2920-2021, on which I am abstaining. And President Hardin? Yes. Ordinance are passed with the noted exceptions. We'll now go to the uh, emergency 30-day uh, uh, legislation. First committee to come before council is the Recreation and Parks Committee. The committee is chaired by President Pro Tem. <laughs> President Pro Tem, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, President Hardin. Um, tonight in Recreation and Parks, we have Ordinance 2310-2021 to authorize and direct, uh, or to authorize the Director of Finance and Management to enter into contract with Harrell's LLC for the purchase of golf course pesticides for the Recreation and Parks Department to waive formal competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Code uh, 329 to authorize the expenditure of $168,480.40 for the purpose per purchase of golf turf pesticides from the Recreation and Parks Operating Fund and to declare an emergency. This purchase is for use at the city's six golf courses. Maintaining uh, course conditions is an important part of securing revenue as the city competes for customers with other local courses. The use of pesticides allows the city to maintain its courses at a competitive level. I'm grateful to the department um, and Mike Musser in particular, the golf division administrator, for their ongoing focus on conservation and limiting the use of pesticides as much as possible. This work includes creating wildlife habitats, pollinator plantings, and focusing on the preservation of other natural areas on courses. The golf division changed its pesticide application program in 2017 and has been able to reduce the amount of product used while still maintaining course conditions. In 2019, the department adopted an integrated pest management policy to reduce usage of pesticides across department operations. I appreciate the department's partnership in these efforts to be responsible environmental stewards of our city managed green spaces. I appreciate the advocacy of Ms. Pam Unger um, as we uh, continue to look into our pesticide usage. Um, and tonight we are waiving competitive bidding and considering emergency action in order to take advantage of deep discounts available through Harold's uh, fall purchasing program, which must be used in December. If there are no questions, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorns, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Thank you, Council President. That's all I have in my committees. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, next committee to come before Council uh, will be the speediest committee of the evening, uh, Public Safety, and that committee is chaired by uh, Council Member uh, Mitch Brown. Thank you, Council President. Uh, tonight in Public Safety Committee, I have a series of resolutions pertaining to liquor objections. My office has been working with City Attorney Klein and Assistant City Attorney Sarah Pomeroy Ms. Pomeroy will provide background into the process, and then she will provide context for each objection we are presenting this evening. 
Attorney Pomeroy and Detective Gant and Detective Evans, who isn't here this evening, are prepared to answer any questions as they may come up. We have public speakers regarding four of these objections. Those four objections will be presented last. Assistant Attorney Pomeroy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, President Gordon, President Brown, Chairman Brown, members of council, and everyone here watching tonight, thank you for your time. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all. Um, I'm Sarah Pomeroy, and I'm the City Attorney with the Zone Initiative of the Columbus City Attorney's Office. I'm now with the Detective Josh Ant of the Columbus Police Department, who is with the PAC Police and Community Together Unit. First, I'll start briefly by going over the general process for liquor objections, both within our office and then how this process plays a role in where we go from here. There are eight major steps to any um, liquor permit objection. And the biggest part where the city attorney's office plays a role along with a lot of other partners is in identifying, investigating, and evaluating what places might be appropriate for an objection. Our work is a partnership with the police, a uh, higher investigative unit, which is the state agency that investigates the current objections, the uh, current violations, the Columbus Fire Department, Public Health, Code Enforcement, along with uh, the various other departments. Um, this process also involves area commissioners, civic associations, block watches, and other community members who are often the first to identify uh, places throughout the year, certainly not just at any one, uh, one moment in time. Um, we are constantly hearing from community members, from uh, police patrolmen, um, and other community organizations about potential locations that might, might have various problematic activities uh, and merit further investigation. When we are looking into what locations potentially merit a liquor objection. The factors that we consider are violations of liquor law, um, narcotics activity, both sales and possession, um, high levels of crimes and violence, specifically looking at uh, gunplay, uh, robberies, stabbings, um, felony assaults, basically looking at all felony conduct at locations. Um, we also are looking at uh, accidental overdoses, recognizing that that is a systemic problem that we have but what I think is unique about both this process and the nuisance abatement process is that we are focused on why a particular location is at all for certain activity and why folks feel they could potentially go to a place um, to conduct this activity. Um, and lastly, we're looking at crimes where alcohol may have played a role um, or not stated in the tools to play a role. As part of the process, um, both through the liver objection process and the parallel nuisance abatement work that we do, uh, a lot of that is the same, whether or not we are potentially bringing a liquor objection or filing a case in environmental court. And part of that process does include notifications to owners, um, typically, especially when we're looking at an location for potential use of the movement case. Um, the detectives from Columbus Police will send out a line letter to locations, notifying them of certain activity that has been happening at their um, location, and offering them an opportunity to meet with the city, in our office to potentially abate that activity. Those conversations happen throughout the year. They happen sometimes before we send a letter, if potentially we can contact through patrol officers or through community leaders. They often do happen after we've actually sent a notification, uh, and they happen throughout the suggestion process. So uh, oftentimes, uh, a location will be noticed of potential objection. And our office, as part of our whole process of investigating, evaluating, um, and then moving forward, we will meet with owners before, during, after the entire objection process and process for uh, any use of the case. All right. All right. We good? Can you all hear me? Okay. This investigation, so this process that I've described, sometimes does lead to a filing of a nuisance ab abatement action in environmental court. That process is usually significantly quicker and usually is used to address um, places where the location um, poses what we would call potentially an immediate danger where we might seek uh, a temporary restraining order against a location. The liquor process is a little bit more drawn out and even more so during this COVID time um, because the Division of Liquor Control has been um, somewhat slow in scheduling, um, scheduling hearings. But 
we evaluate everything in both of these tracks, and when it comes time for liquor objections, um, I'm obviously here tonight to present the ones that we feel do merit an objection. There are a handful that throughout the year we have already filed a case against and potentially gotten a resolution. There are a handful before you tonight that are in the process of already having a case open and we are still talking with those owners, thinking through solutions and working with the environmental court. So after uh, our office, in conjunction with all of those groups that I already mentioned, um, settles on the list that we feel are appropriate for liquor objections. We obviously present them here to city council. The process from here uh, is relatively straightforward. If um, council decides to adopt the resolutions lodging the liquor objections that are proposed tonight, um, the next step is that there is a hearing, a public hearing before the Division of Liquor Control. Now, in this time since the start of COVID, those hearings have been incredibly slow to schedule. They, they, we have some hearings that are um, a year plus in the waiting in terms of scheduling any sort of hearing. Um, so that's why you will see a handful of the resolutions tonight that are actually repetitive from ones that we la lodged last year, as well as ones that we may have lodged during the year for um, various requests for transfers or new permits. Um, the general outcomes that come from this uh, process after a public hearing, after the evidence is presented before the Division of Liquor Control, an objection may be sustained, at which point um, the permit would be, would be t taken, although there is a right of appeal. The objection might be overruled by the division, at which point the uh, location could continue operating. Um, some establishments choose to go ahead and forfeit a permit after an objection, it's their choice. Uh, and then what I would say is happens very frequently is that the city ends up actually reaching an agreement with a lot of permit holders and business owners, and often including the property owner, that, that governs essentially the operation of that location. So in lieu of taking a permit and potentially rendering a business um, out of business or rendering a location completely vacant, uh, our office will usually enter into a, an agreed order that is then filed with environmental court that may cover certain items such as security at the location, additional lighting improvements, cameras that are required, staffing levels, staffing training. There's a lot of elements that could be a part of these agreements. And we have found, um, certainly since my time and even before my, my predecessor, that this um, often, I think, produces great results in terms of both cooperation with the business owner, input from the community, um, and as well as uh, some sort of enforcement to make sure that things continue on, on the right path moving forward. All right, and then the last process uh, item that I will mention just for, uh, for everyone's information is that you'll see a handful of the objections tonight uh, are repetitive in that we, the, the city had objected to what's called a mid-year objection sometime during this year. Mm -hmm. Every week on every council agenda, there are a list of new permit requests and requests for transfers of permits. Um, those come up. We have a short amount of time to go ahead and talk to police, talk to patrol, talk to community members to decide whether to that is necessary, uh, and then we typically lodge the objections. Where we are now that we've reached the point of renewal is that any outstanding objection, whether it be a mid-year or a renewal from last year, um, needs to effectively be renewed. The objection needs to be made again in order to hold our place while we either are negotiating with the owners or with the I will pause there and any questions, otherwise I'll defer back to you. Uh, if there are no questions at this particular time from my colleagues, let me move into the resolution. Uh, tonight we have resolution 019X 2021 to object to the renewal of liquor permit number 7641785 held by South Livingston Inc. doing business in Shell Livingston Shell located at 1937 East Livingston Avenue, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, Ms. Pomeroy? Thank you. Location is actually our highest this evening. Um, this location has seen uh, a number of issues and calls ranging from homicides, shootings, stabbings, robberies, uh, a number of intoxicated individuals also need assistance, um, numerous narcotics complaints, and overdoses at the location. You'll see the fire alone responded nine times to overdose at this location. Given this number of calls, um, our office actually filed a nuisance abatement act recently, so this 
an open case in the environmental court. I certainly feel it merits action. If there are no comments from my colleagues, I move for adoption. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorns, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Adopted. I have also resolution 0195X 2021 to object to the renewal of liquor permit number 2097745 held by Destination 2 Success LLC doing business as Beverage Warehouse located at 847 East 11th Avenue, Columbus, Ohio 43211. Ms. Pomeroy. Thank you. Police have been called to this location Beverage Warehouse for multiple incidents involving gunplay, including homicide and shots fired weapons offenses, in addition to dispatch medical treatment for those suffering from overdose. Um, uh, the Columbus Police and the Ohio Investigative Unit have also cited the location for underage sale. And this is actually a, a location that my predecessor, Bill Sperlaza, had objected to in 2018, and we do have them under an agreed order. Uh, that case has been reopened on contempt in environmental court, and given the, everything that has been happening this year, we feel merits an objection. If there are no comments, I move for adoption. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorns, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Adopted. Also, I have resolution 0196X 2021 to object to the renewal of liquor permit number 4155585 -5 held by Isaac Usman, Inc., doing business as Whittier Food Mark, located at 917 East Whittier Street, Columbus, Ohio, 43206. Ms. Pomeroy? Thank you. Uh, the Columbus Division of Police have made arrests at this location for multiple shootings, including homicide, multiple robberies, and drug possession at this location. Um, additional calls for service show significant uh, numbers of shots fired and narcotics complaints, as well as other disturbances uh, involving intoxicated individuals. This is at one of our objections where every objection that comes to us through community members or patrol. This is one that we have had a number of community members we need to follow office about what we are potentially doing to address issues at this location. If there are no comments from my colleagues, I move for adoption. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorns, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Adopted. Resolution 0197X 2021 to object to the renewal of liquor permit number 91335120634 held by UDF Limited Partnership uh, 2 doing business as United Dairy Farmers, number 634, located at 168 North High Street, Columbus, Ohio. Ms. Pomeroy? This establishment has seen a high level of activity. She keeps wearing out the microphones. <laughs> I'm just doing so well. There we go, okay. All right, this establishment has seen a high level of activity, including responses to persons with guns, knives, multiple fights, robberies, narcotics complaints, uh, and various disturbances, again, involving intoxicated individuals. Um, this one in particular is actually, I think, an example of how we start to work with individuals. We sent out a warning letter relatively recently to this location, as well as the next resolution that's before you, um, both United Dairy Farmers, and were contacted by the head of security for the Central Ohio area for UDF. Um, I've already been in dialogue with them about what security improvements they have made, what might be necessary moving forward. There has not been a, a nuisance case filed on these, but this is one where um, this process, I think, is fruitful in terms of starting those discussions and, and jump-starting where uh, we can potentially get with making safety uplifts at these locations. If there are no comments from my colleagues, I move for adoption. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Resolution 0198X 2021 to object to the renewal of liquor permit number 91335 120649 held by UDF Limited Partnership 2, doing business as United Dairy Farmers 649, located at 530 South Hague Avenue, Columbus, Ohio, 43204. Ms. Pomeroy? Thank you. This location has seen a significant number of police and fire runs involving crimes of violence, but more significantly, um, both narcotics, overdose activity, intoxicated individuals involved in various uh, criminal activity, and prostitution. Um, Columbus Fire alone has been uh, dispatched to this location 54 times in the last year. That's the highest of all of the objections that you have before you tonight, including for eight individuals suffering from an overdose at the location. Um, there have been multiple robberies, uh, a significant number of drug offenses, and uh, therefore, given the high calls of service as well, 
it merits an objection. If there are no objections, uh, I move, no, no comments from my colleagues, I move for adoption. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorns, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Adopted. Also, I have resolution 0200-2021 to object to the renewal of liquor permit number 0079740 held by Ahmad's Petroleum, Inc. doing business at Sunoco, located at 2725 West Broad Street, Columbus, Ohio. I do have a speaker on this particular location, uh, Mr. Mohammed Mubarak. Is he in the audience? Mr. Mubarak, would you please come to the microphone, please? He's speaking for the objection, as I understand it. How you doing? Um, so I just bought this location November 8th. You know, I did not know nothing about it. Um, we asked our lawyers to see if anything's wrong with this location. He, he assured us there was nothing wrong with it. His friends of us today just told us about this meeting today. So we just registered a couple of hours ago. But since we took it over, we put brand new lights, over 15 lights outside, 32, 32 camera system outside. There's nobody sitting outside this parking lot. It was before because there was an outlet outside that people were charging stuff on. So there was people outside before, but right now there's nobody out there. Every day I got a security guy out there every single day now. Um, the place is closed inside, you know, it's just during hours, one to six in the morning closes inside. So it's not 24 hours outside, inside basically. Um, we're doing everything we could to work with you guys. So we, we were asking for if anything we could do better to come, you know, talk to us and help us out or see what we could do with you guys. We got other locations, there's no problems nowhere. So this is the only location that we just bought. So I'm, we're trying to figure out what to do. We didn't even know about this till today. Just two hours ago, we just registered. I registered my name because friends told me that this location is on the list. So we're asking if we could do anything to help Thank us you, out. Thank you, Mr. Um, Ms. Pomeroy. Thank you, council member. And uh, as with any of, of these objections, um, hearing that an owner a is willing to work with us, has already made some improvements prior to speaking with us. That's, that's exactly what, what we're interested in, in talking about, and I welcome further discussion um, with the new owner for this location. Obviously, when we are doing uh, these evaluations for objections, we're looking at the activity at the location over at least a year, usually two years. Um, the activity that led us here today uh, was a significant number of runs. We had felony assaults, robberies, gunplay, um, eight different instances where Columbus Fire responded to overdoses. <coughs> Um, obviously, I'm, I'm very happy to learn that uh, we have an owner here who's uh, willing to work with us, and I, I actually look forward to, to further discussions with them. That's part of this process, and uh, oftentimes uh, there's snags in notification from the Division of Liquor Control such that um, sometimes we're not always aware when a new person has potentially taken over until maybe a few months after the fact. Um, so I would say moving forward, we would still believe that this merits an objection given the past activity, uh, and I think that that will be helpful in moving discussions forward, but very much looking forward to speaking with this owner. Are there any questions from the colleagues? Mr. Remy? I would ask that you table this. I would ask that you table this. Any other comments from my colleagues? Councilman in favor? I was just wondering if you could tell us the other, um, you said you have some other establishments. What are the other establishments you have in Columbus? So we got some in uh, Rendsburg, Ohio. Reynoldsburg? Yeah. Okay. We got in uh, North High Street a couple. We got in West Side a couple. So it's, a, it's a, about like four or five of us partnership. So we don't got no problem nowhere else, you know. So we, wanted, we never even knew about this issue. That's the problem. You know, usually when you buy a store, you know, we just bought it for, you know, it's big money, but, you know, we just bought it, you know, and it's hard to lose a liquor license. You know, if you lose a liquor license, we just lost a lot of money, you know. We didn't even know, you know, usually it's a process when you do this. You buy a store, your lawyer looks at liquor license, it's clean online. So if you look at the liquor division, they don't got no tickets to the store. The store don't got no issue of that sort of item. So you don't even know there's something going on outside, you know. But when we took it over, there's nothing out there, you know. Because we put brand new lights, new camera system, security is out there. You know, we got good employees with us. There's nobody in this parking lot. You go drive today, there's nobody out there. You know, so there's nothing going on. 
I mean, we know, we, we understand there's some locations got issue, but to close a business down because there was an issue before, you know, we don't know about it. It's not right, you know. And we we're trying to work with you guys, you know. This could be anywhere, you know. We're trying, you know. But you were aware of the other issues associated with the property absent. Never. Look, at the lawyer never told us nothing, you know. They usually look at it online, you know. Usually when you buy a business, they go to look at control, you know, on the website and everything. There's no nuisance case on this place. There's no issue in this case. They don't got no tickets. They're clean, the store. On paper, you know, other than what we found out today, it's clean. On paper, it's clean. So if there was an issue, it should be on, you know, aligned with liquor control or somebody, but there's nothing. No, I mean, in regards to the criminal activity that was occurring at the venue, you stated that you came into the venue or to the sp to the space yeah. and updated lighting and yeah, you did some it was, other. It, you know, it's, it's a, we understand there's West Side, you know, it's a different kind of neighborhood, you know, but we, we did everything we could, you know, but there's nobody out there. So, I mean, once we put the lighting, new camera system, there was just an outlet outside. People were using it for electric, but we did not know we took that off. Everything is off, you know. Mm -hmm. So we did our best, you know, but there's nobody out there. So we don't know what to do. You know, we don't know what else to do. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Tyson. How, excuse me, thank you. How did you find out about the this issue that we're talking about today? Uh, by a couple of store owners who's on the list. So, I'm sorry, you said a couple of the store owners on the list. You know, this is a small community. Every store owner knows each other. Okay. Know? So they know we just bought it, you know. Okay. Are you affiliated at all with the previous owner? No, no, nothing at all. He already took his money. He's gone. Yeah, so he already took all his money up front, you know. I mean, we got paperwork and everything to show everything. We gave him everything. Thank you. Because like there was nothing on paper to show that is something wrong in uh, this location. Okay, so I have, I, can I like to ask a question back to uh, mm -hmm. Attorney Pomeroy? So depending on how we take this vote today, you know, I think you stated about the process. So I guess there's two, I guess I'm going to ask you two questions. Mm -hmm. One, if we were to continue with this process to, um, to remove the liquor license. What, so you just mentioned, so that's one, if we, were con you, if we were to vote for the resolution for us to continue to move this process forward, um, you're still stating that you could still work with this applicant, with this new owner, and this process could, could not continue to move down the path, correct? Correct, and, I, and um, I think a nuance here that I will explain a little bit, and this is very specific to the, to the liquor process, this permit is still listed as the prior owner's permit. And so until that there has been, and potentially the application has not made its way through the process, that is a little bit of a slow thing. Uh, Any time ownership of a business changes, they're required to change their ownership of the liquor permit. So as of right now, the re resolution before you is actually the objection to the liquor permit owned by the prior owner. Um, so th that would be my first comment. And then my second is that absolutely, anytime that we lodge one of these objections, the hearings for most of these, even in a, in a quote, normal time, don't typically get set for at least two to three months. And I would guess at this point, we're looking at six months before the division would even potentially set any sort of hearing. We very much use that time to talk with owners. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, we, we very often come to some sort of an agreement. Sometimes it's memorialized with environmental court. Other times it's not, especially if we have a new owner. Um, that governs a lot of what it sounds like this owner may have already done. Uh, I will say that having the objection though out there has proven time and again to be very effective in making sure that things actually do get done. Uh, but our office is absolutely committed to talking with market owners uh, throughout the year, certainly at this time as well. And so I'm asking, so by the time, so this is again for the previous owner and there's still a process that's in play here that um, for this owner, once the paperwork goes through and you see a new owner that ha to, a new owner, then this process could stop. And the other is during the time that you're, this process is moving forward, that you're working with them, it does not prevent this gentleman's business from continuing to have his liquor license and move forward. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. We do not object to any operation of the business while the process is pending. If we had a concern about that, it probably would have already merited a nuisance abatement filing, and we would have done that separately, and that's not the case here. So us voting to approve this resolution does not harm his business at this point? No, it does not. Thank you. 
Councilman Remy, I know you asked at the table. Do you occur? Yes, sir. Let, let me just clarify, though. So, one, I mean, are we putting an albatross on him as a new owner? I mean, I just got texted that that place is brighter than anything on the west side now, and it wasn't like that previously. Um, so the question is, you know, is he going to spend a lot of legal fees trying to, 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 you know, clear this up? Should we not table it until the transfer happens and you, you work with them? I mean, we can revisit this at any given time. But, I mean, I, I'd hate to see him have to do an undue burden because he wasn't aware and he's already taken the steps to fix a lot of the problems that, that this place has had. So, you know, to put that albatross on him, I wouldn't, you know, I, I, I can't agree with that necessarily. I, cer I certainly understand um, what, what you're saying, Council Member. I, I, we have found in our experience, even where transfers have occurred, that the objection process is still very valuable in terms of ensuring um, that corrections continue to be manta maintained, that we also have the time in order to evaluate the corrections. I mean, as we sit here today, um, this is the first that I'm hearing of a potential new ownership. I, on paper, uh, the owner has mentioned that there wasn't something filed with the Division of Liquor Control. That's the, the basis of this objection has been Columbus police reports um, and uh, you know community complaints. I know the um, Greater Hilltop Area Commission has expressed support for this objection. Again, they also may have been assuming that was based on you know prior activity. I certainly understand where you're coming from. Just from our experience in the city attorney's office, uh, we still believe that the that having that objection go through uh, is is merited both based on the prior activity and to allow us to continue with fruitful negotiations so let me ask you this so if, if you guys if we do object to this and you guys are working through this in two weeks three weeks four weeks from now you realize the transfer has gone through he's done everything to comply um, now what so if uh the city and, and the owner have, have talked and, and, and feel like they're in a good spot in terms of safety precautions uh, taken at that location. We have the opportunity to either withdraw an objection uh, or to put on what you can, I guess, call a perfunctory hearing where we would say, in lieu of, an, of a hearing division of liquor control, we are not presenting any evidence because we have seen that they do X, Y, Z. And that's put on the record with the division of liquor control effectively withdrawing any objection. You don't have to come back to us to withdraw? Uh, to, to do that, we don't have to. Um, or if you wanted to fully withdraw a resolution, that would come from you all. Uh, but typically how we have uh, handled this process is if we reach some sort of an agreement and we stay in contact with uh, Councilmember Brown's office, obviously throughout this whole process, uh, we will essentially not present evidence supporting the objection because we, city attorney's office, after talking with police and community members, feel that it has, um, that everything has been resolved in terms of our, our concerns. And as far as his costs go, I mean, if you are if you're dealing with him directly, then I'm assuming there wouldn't be undue burden on him. Is that I mean, is that that I mean, that's correct from our perspective. Certainly in my experience, I have uh, handled these negotiations working directly with uh, an owner with or without an attorney and working with attorneys. Uh, either way, we've been able to reach ag agreements that satisfy the city's concerns, whether or not um, the owner has chosen to obtain counsel and go through those costs. But I would say the biggest costs that are gonna potentially be put on anyone in this process are the security uplifts that we need to discuss. The implementation of lighting, cameras, potential security. Uh, that is where, from sitting where I'm at, that th those should be the expenses that are spent here. Councilman Tyson. Thank you, uh, Council Member Brown. So at the end of the day, this is a problem property. At this, yes. uh, that's what we're here. Correct. And and so now that it has a new owner, the new owner has to make sure that this property that he didn't have any knowledge of it being a problem property, that because of what he's hearing today, he understands there have been some concerns. And yes, he bought it about a week ago, and he says he's made some improvements in it. But generally, a problem property doesn't turn over in a week. So. This, we need to, at least from my perspective, to, I appreciate that he's purchased the property and that whatever the problems were, they have to be resolved. 
to continue to keep this liquor license. And so, again, I think that from my perspective, I, I would absolutely be voting to keep the, I would be voting for uh, this resolution so that one, th that this problem property does not continue to be a problem property, that the new owner will work with you and the area commission to ensure that this is not continuing. And if he does those things, then we don't really have to worry. And it may mean that he does have to spend some money because of whatever, like he said, the lighting, or whatever is necessary to help improve the property. So that's just, I mean, so you buy a property, there's a problem here, we have to resolve the issue, and then you can continue to move forward with selling you know, alcohol in, in your business. Is that what we're talking yes. about? Yes, yeah, Thank I you. would agree. Thank you. Councilman Remy, uh, are you comfortable with the explanation that uh, the city attorney's office has provided? The whole point here is that we have new ownership that took place just recently within the past couple of hours of being aware of what's going on. However, this council should move forward with the adoption of the objection to give the city attorney's office the leverage to deal with the new ownership to make the necessary adjustments and changes that need to be made in the area. The, the, Mr. Bobark now has a contact with Ms. Pomeroy they can figure out how they can make the same work to everybody's best satisfaction. But at that particular location currently, we've had over 144 calls for service. That is just unacceptable. And Mr. Mubarak, I would say to you, then you have to work with the city attorney's office to figure out how to minimize that to an appropriate level. But we're going to, I'm going to still recommend objection to this particular liquor objection, a, a term, resolution. Okay. Uh, there being no further questions, I move for adoption. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorns, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President, Hardin. Adopt it. Uh, so I have resolution yeah. 0204-2021 to object to the renewal liquor permit number 841-899-40430 held by Speedway LLC doing business at Speedway number 2. 1216, located at 6175 East Livingston Avenue, Columbus, Ohio, 43232. Ms. Pomeroy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Police have been called to this location um, for multiple reports of shootings, robberies, assaults, and other crimes involving weapons at this location. There was a homicide in December of 2020 uh, that initially brought this location to our attention. As you can see, the calls for service at this place are significant. I, would, I think they're the second highest of the list that we have tonight. Um, and the Columbus Fire in the last year has responded to this location 11 different times um, to help individuals suffering from an overdose. Therefore, we ask uh, for this resolution to be passed. If there are no objections, I move for adoption. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you. Also tonight, I have resolution 0208X2021 to object the renewal of liquor permit number 983225 issued to YMA LLC, doing business as Payless Auto Service, a.k.a. Marathon, located at 744 East Hudson Street, Columbus, Ohio, 43211. Ms. Pomeroy? Thank you. The city objected to the renewal of the liquor permit at this location last November, which had not yet been set for a full hearing. Um, currently, the business is actually under a preliminary injunction in environmental court. This is one of the ones, especially given the high numbers of calls for service, the uh, narcotics activity, the violence activity at this location, where we did file a nuisance abatement lawsuit this year. Um, in our negotiations with the ownership here and the property ownership, our understanding is that the business intends to leave the premises by early January, potentially maybe a month after that, maybe a little bit longer. Um, but they are under a preliminary agreement that governs the hours, uh, security, staffing, uh, cleanliness at the location. This is actually one where they also were cited for code enforcement violations for not uh, cleaning up the lot um, where, they, uh, where they run their business. Um, the location has had underage sale violations. Uh, 2021 offenses um, still include felony assaults, shootings and robberies and drug offenses. So 
even though there is a potential resolution on the horizon for this location, um, we're still requesting that the objection be effectively renewed um, due to the fact that this business is still operating there. Uh, and we, again, need to maintain uh, that leverage in order to continue to hold their feet to the responsibilities that they promised in the court order. Councilman Favor. Ms. Pomeroy, is this an a auto repair service? So this location and this location was originally both auto repair and a gas station. It is actually now just a gas station. The auto repair part of the business has closed. However, they applied for their permit with the name Payless Auto Service. Mm -hmm. um, they have not actually applied to change that name on their permit. Technically, they are required to. Uh, that's more of a matter for the Ohio Investigative Unit to to come. Um, to discuss with them, but yes, it used to be both, and now it is just a gas station. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, I move for adoption. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorns, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President, Hardin. Adopted. Uh, I have now resolution 20210X2021 to object to the renewal liquor permit number 241. 2996010 issued to Muhammad Ashraf, which is doing business as Convenient Plus Food Mark located at 3351 East Main Street, Columbus, Ohio. Ms. Pomeroy. Thank you. This is another one where the city objected last year uh, to the renewal of the permit at this location. It has not yet been set for a hearing. After our objection last year, we did begin discussions with the ownership at this location, talked about some of the uplifts that they needed to make. Um, those discussions uh, effectively stalled as we started talking about memorializing that into an agreement. At this point, the city is willing to resume those discussions. However, we are now just waiting for the Division of Liquor Control to set this for a hearing. Um, originally, the objection was made due to multiple incidents of gunfire at the location, narcotics complaint, and overdoses. Uh, the 2021 activity here has improved some. The numbers have gone down, but there have still been multiple robberies at the location since the last objection. If there are no objections, I move for adoption. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorns, Baker, Reedy, Tyson, President Hardin. Adopted. Resolution 0211X2021 to object to the object to the new permit number 7670505 held by Salav K. Inc. doing business as Ameristop located at 4432 Wall Street, Walford Street, Columbus, Ohio, 43224. Ms. Pomeroy? Thank you. This is one of the uh, objections that I discussed where we had what I would call a mid-year objection. In December of 2020, so almost a year ago, the city objected to a request to transfer the permit from the prior permit owner to the current permit owner, um, but it was not yet set for a full hearing. Um, the objection originally was based on multiple reports of robbery as well as drug sales and possession at the premises. This is one where, um, according to patrol, we have understood that even though the permit transfer has not officially gone through per our objection last year, the operation has effectively transferred. So technically you do have the new people who are, who are operating. Um, since the previous objection though, there has still been multiple incidents of violence and uh, uh, we have gotten an underage uh, liquor sale violation at this location. Primary activity here has been drugs and robberies. Uh, therefore, in order to preserve um, the outstanding objection and given the activity, we're asking for a renewal here of the objection. And um, this is one where we have been in contact with an attorney for this location, just in the process of negotiating what a potential agreement may be. So um, everything is still very much in the middle of the whole process. If there are no objections from my colleagues, I for adoption. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Baker, Reedy, Tyson, President Hardy. Resolution 0212-2021 to object to the renewal of liquor permit number 955-617-90005 held by Wheatland Food, Inc., doing business as Wheatland Foods located at 1432 Mount Vernon Avenue, Columbus, Ohio, 43203. Ms. Pomeroy? 
Thank you. This is another one where we have a uh, mid-year objection that was lodged in September of 2020, and actually at last year's meeting, we also objected to the renewal um, of, of this permit. Both requests have not yet been heard by the Division of Liquor Control. Um, last year, community complaints are actually what spurned um, us potentially looking into this location as a potential objection. Um, there were multiple narcotics-related arrests and uh, concerns with robbery activity at the location. In 2021, there have been uh, an underage liquor sale as well as uh, additional robberies, and there's been multiple instances of Columbus Fire responding to the location for overdoses. Um, this is one where activity has slowed down since we lodged our initial objection in September 2020. However, there has not been uh, a lot of dialogue with the ownership here. We, we have reached out to them I, I, at least once or twice and we have not had any movement, so at this point, and often what does happen sometimes is it sometimes takes the hearing actually getting scheduled for there to be movement in some of our discussions. That's uh, relatively typical in this, in this work. So therefore, we're asking um, for this resolution to be passed. If there are no objections, I move for adoption. Second. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. I have resolution 0213X 2021 to object to the renewal of liquor permit number 5077469 held by Lena Food Inc. doing business as Weber Road Market located at 900 East Weber Road, Columbus, Ohio, 43211. Ms. Pomeroy. Thank you. In May of this year, the city objected to a permit transfer request at this location, which has not yet been set for a hearing, as we've been discussing. Uh, this objection, though, was based on multiple homicides at this location, arrests for prostitution, assault, and additional weapons offenses, in addition to community complaints. Um, Columbus police runs to the location include uh, numerous robberies, intoxicated individuals needing assistance, and treatment for overdoses. At Due to the activity at this location, especially the homicides that occurred this year, um, the, our office has filed a nuisance abatement action against this location. We have already been in discussions with their attorney, and they are now under a preliminary injunction order, again, governing at least preliminary items such as hours, staffing, uh, increase in lighting, and there will be um, continued discussions with them. Um, the city is hopeful that we might be able to come to a resolution with this one, but uh, but it's still, again, outstanding. There's no permanent resolution here, and therefore, given the activity, we're asking for uh, the objection to their renewal. If there are no objections, I move for adoption. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorns, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Adopt it. Resolution 0214X2020-21 to object to the renewal of liquor permit number 2A4. 8547 held by 40, 4027 Thirsty Drive Through Inc. doing business as Thirsty Drive Through located at 4027 Livingston Avenue. Ms. Pomeroy? Thank you. In June and September of this year, the city objected to two separate permit transfer requests at this location, neither of which was set for a hearing. Um, why two separate requests? Uh, I'm, what I, I'm guessing occurred is that the first request was withdrawn and then they submitted a new application for a, a permit transfer at this location. So uh, the September 2021, we renewed that request based on um, the both community and Columbus uh, police patrol concerns, underage liquor sales both in 2020 and this year, as well as a homicide at the end of December. Additional calls for service this year include intoxicated individuals needing assistance and um, numerous incidents of motor vehicle theft this is one of our uh, lower incidents, uh, lower calls for service locations. However, given the concerns that we received and that we have an outstanding mid-year objection, uh, we still very much look forward to hearing from this owner. We have not yet had any discussions with them, and we feel it merits an objection. Again, if there are no comments from my colleagues, I move for adoption. Second. Clerk, please call the row. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Adopt it. Resolution 0215X 2021 to object to the renewal of liquor permit number 2630352 issued to Fakra Inc., which is doing business as PJ's Grill, located at 15 East Frombays Avenue, Columbus, Ohio, 43201. Ms. Pomeroy? 
Thank you. The city objected to the renewal of this liquor permit at the location last year also in November of 2020. It had not, it has not had its full hearing. Um, the objection though was actually lodged based on investigations primarily from the Ohio Investigative Unit uh, in conjunction with our office and Columbus Police. In a three year period, there were 50, 53 actual reports of underage sales. I know it says 51. Um, and this location has continued to have underage sales since we made our objection last year. When I was speaking with the Ohio Investigative Unit folks about this location compared to others potentially in the campus area, they mentioned that this location had double the number of incidents of underage sales compared to other locations in that same area. So given that activity and that obviously it has not yet been set for a hearing, we're asking for a renewal of the objection we made last year. If there are no objections, I move for adoption. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorns, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Adopt it. I have resolution 0219X 2021 to object to the renewal of liquor permit number 6483944006 held by ROB Enterprises Inc. doing business as Marathon Westland Shell Car Wash located at 2805. West Broad Street, Columbus, Ohio, 43204. Ms. Pomeroy. Thank you. Police and fire runs to this location have been significant. Um, definitely one of the higher ones of all the uh, list of objections this year. These runs have included persons with guns and knives, robberies, shots fired, other narcotics complaints, those suffering from overdoses. Columbus Fire has been called to this location for overdoses uh, nine different times. Uh, and additional arrests at the location include robbery, drug possession, and additional weapons offenses. Um, this is location, we have actually been in touch with the owner just recently over the last couple weeks. We're just trying to nail down a time to actually meet them at their property, talk through ways that they can uh, start to begin security uplifts. Um, those discussions are just starting, but uh, the owner has already reached out to both myself and, De and Detective Gant. But as we sit here today, given the activity, um, we feel it merits an objection. If there are no objections, I move for adoption. Second. Clark, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorns, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Adopt it. I have resolution 0206X 2021 to object to the renewal of liquor permit number 41801750002 held by J. Mack Investments, LLC, doing business as Moments Grill and Lounge located at 2545 Petzinger Road, Columbus, Ohio. I do have a public speaker, uh, Mr. John Delia. Uh, is he present? Mr. Delia, please state your full name, your address, your affiliation with Moments Grill and Inc. Lounge. You have three minutes, sir. The floor is yours. John Delia, 2545 Petsinger Road, Columbus, 43209. Moments has been in business for approximately eight years now, almost eight years. Um, Moments is a bar that caters for mostly older people. Um, We've never gotten any notice that we were doing something wrong. Um, we've got CPD there every night. Um, we have people that come in the bar that are older. Um, the Corvette Club is there, Steelers Aftermath, Brown Backers, people such as those. Um, we have a lot of cops, a lot of city workers. A lot of people come there. Um, I don't know what What's going on here, but certainly we're in a shopping center. Um, there's a deli that's been open, you know, not too far from there. Um, we've never had no problems before. This year we did have some problems. We try to address them. But everything that happens in that shopping center is not our fault. Nothing has happened on the inside of the bar. Um, a lot of people like the bar. And we continue to service the community. Um, we participate in the community, and we've done good by it. You know, 
Recently, we made a donation to the um, school for a computer lab. And on, on the day that we went to make the donation, that's the day they came and shut us down. Um, that's it. Thank you, sir. Um, Ms. Pomeroy? Thank you. Can you pull up on the screen the issues involving uh, Petsuga Row, please? Thank you. So this location is unique for a few reasons in terms of the objection process and where we are in that process. The city did object to the renewal of the liquor permit at this location owned by JMAC Investments, LLC, uh, in November of 2020. It has not yet been set for a full hearing. However, in the meantime, due to significant gunplay at this location, uh, other incidents of felony assault, um, the city actually filed for a temporary restraining order to shut down this location in April of this year. It ended up ultimately being boarded up for about a month, at which time the city reached an agreement with the owners, and Mr. Delia was in, was in the room in, in those negotiations. They were represented by counsel. Um, I understand there has potentially been some um, discussions where uh, uh, not being satisfied with the result of that, but counsel on behalf of JMAC Investments and the property owner did enter into an agreement with Moments, uh, which included various requirements for continued operation, so they did reopen as of May of, May of this year. Uh, it included additional security requirements, uh, and it also included a requirement that the location Moments at Petzinger be vacated, that Moments leave the location by the end of November. That was incorporated into a court order that was signed by counsel for JMAC Investments, counsel for the uh, property owner, as well as uh, our office and the environmental court judge, Mingo. So that deadline has not yet come. Uh, in order to preserve the, and make sure that that order is either followed or if it needs to be reopened and changed, um, the issues are still on the table and the activity has continued at this location. Since the uh, filing of that lawsuit, they did implement the security requirements. We've had multiple discussions with the, with the ownership and the management and special duty officers at this location. There was just recently a shooting, however, there even uh, just in the last couple of weeks that actually didn't even make the materials that you have before you. Um, given all of this that is happening with this location, the city very much feels that an objection and a renewal of last year's objection is still warranted while we still have court ordered deadlines that have not yet been met potential discussions about those deadlines changing and uh, operations changing or, la or staying at this location. Um, so therefore, we're asking that this objection uh, be, up, be uh, adopted by you all. I'm obviously happy to take any questions since this is a little bit unique of a situation. Are there any other questions from my council colleagues? Seeing none, I move uh, Councilor Favor. So, um, is the activity, it's occurring inside of Moments or is it a part of the, um, the shopping center as the owner indicated? The large amount, especially of the violent activity has been in, in the lot just outside. However, there's not many other businesses that are operating at that same time when, um, when the activity has occurred. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, yes, if you're part of a shopping center, we, we, we take a look to see, okay, what's open when, what, what might be the draw. Um, Largely, we found in the incidents that it's been when Moments is open, Moments is there. And absolutely, we have this discussion very frequently with any nuisance abatement cases where um, activity that happens inside is one category. Activity that happens just outside is another. Activity that maybe happens on a sidewalk is maybe another question. Um, property owners, business owners still have the responsibility, obviously, to uh, maintain and maintain safety for all of their, their patrons and the, you know, the immediate area that they control, especially when they're the ones operating when something might be open or, um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> and from your, uh, the information that you have today is that from May when the order was, the um, agreement was um, reached between the owner and the city, that the activity has increased it's actually, it has, has decreased since decreased. the order. Yeah, it has decreased, yes. Okay. Absent uh, an incident, a recent shooting that just occurred literally, I think, two weeks ago mm -hmm. at the location. Uh, and we had every intention of not having to renew the objection. Uh, it's just that with the deadlines that are in that court order, had the deadline been end of October, we might not, we not, might not actually be here. However, now learning, A, that 
the deadline might not be met based on my communications with uh, the ownership of moments. Therefore, we would need to reopen the court case that got us here in the first place, even for last year's round of objections. And, and just so I'm, um, I'm clear, the court order is, is stating that moments leaves, correct? correct. Shuts down. Correct. Or leaves, uh, leaves that location. So they could go they elsewhere. They can continue and take the license with them. Yes. Well, they would have to reply for a transfer, a, a permit request, but we would not object to that. Um, that was that was all part of the discussions, but part of the requirement of the court order was that they don't do not leave or that they do leave this location by November twenty eighth. Okay. Okay. Thank you. If there are no further questions from my colleagues, again, I move for adoption. Second. Clerk, right, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorns, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Adopted. I have resolution 0207X 2021 to object to the renewal of liquor permit number 4621325005 issued to Kumram, I'm not saying that properly, hopefully, but LLC, which is doing business as Mobile Mart, located at 830 Parsons Avenue, Columbus, Ohio, 432. I do have a speaker who would like to speak to the objection, Mr. Nakwash Ahmed. Please uh, come approach the podium. Mr. Ahmed, please state your name, your address, your affiliation to the mobile mark. You have three minutes, sir. Okay, sir. My name is Nakash Ahmed, and uh, I own that uh, gas station, 830 Parson Avenue. And uh, we own that location for four years now. And uh, we got some uh, objection on that uh, liquor license. And uh, we're working uh, with Sarah uh, uh, for that uh, the improvements we have done there. Like uh, we used to operate 24 hours a day and now we're operating from 7 a.m. to midnight. And uh, we have done some upgrades uh, like lightings and uh, uh, new security camera system. And uh, so far, we, uh, we make sure nobody stands outside, and uh, we're working with them. Thank you, sir. Ms. Pomeroy? Thank you. And yes, this this is an example of one where we have been working with uh, with the property owner or with the business owner as well as their attorney. Uh, we are in the process of finalizing a negotiated agreement that will incorporate some of the changes that they've already made uh, that will be filed in environmental court. So uh, those processes, those negotiations are currently ongoing. Um, activity at this location has uh, gotten somewhat better since we did file the objection last year. This is another one where we objected in November of 2020, and now we are here because it had not yet been set for a full hearing. Um, community concerns originally put this location on uh, our radar and it let and there were multiple arrests for narcotics issues um, there was also a homicide that occurred at this location in 2020 uh, and fire has responded for various overdoses we've had a few robberies this year but things have definitely gotten better since we lodged our objection last year however to, to get this agreement over the finish line the objection will allow us to continue down that path of agreement and uh, we we are certainly close but um, I need to complete the full process and uh, believe an objection is still merited here, especially given that we still have it outstanding from last year. There are no comments from my colleagues. I move for uh, adoption. Second. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, Councilor Mc I, Brown. I just, thank you so much. I, I, I am just wondering, given that the, um, the business owner is showing cooperation along the way, you now have a working relationship where you're doing these things. Um, you know, is it, is it really necessary to, I, I, I appreciate the use of these as leverage and I appreciate in my conversations with you how seriously you take it to recognize what the business owner is putting in um, and making sure that you're retracting the liquor objection, liquor permit objection if, you know, they don't show progress. But um, given what he listed, I, I am just like, what is the final amount that you need him to do in order to feel, you know, good about the progress made on this site? Ultimately, the reason I ask, yeah. I'm sorry, one more thing is, is that um, some of what you talk about is very serious that has occurred on the property, things like homicide um, and drug activity. 
And I think we all can recognize in this room that those are issues far larger than an individual business owner, right? And he alone doesn't have the ability to control those forces at play. And so we can expect him to do what he can do, and we can hold him accountable for those things. Sounds like a lot of that progress has been made. So I am just curious, like, what's that last mile that you're really looking for that demonstrates to you this business owner is doing everything in their power? And now it's time. The city needs to step up. We need to do everything in our power to also help the safety situation. Absolutely. And I, and I think what ultimately closes this loop uh, is, and again, from both my experience and my predecessor's experience, is sometimes some initial improvements are made and then there's zero, uh, zero accountability moving, for, moving forward. So what we seek to do, and I think in this case specifically, what I think closes that loop is memorializing that in a written agreement with uh, commitments from the, uh, the business owner and, and sometimes the city as well. I think one of the, the commitments that we make in this process certainly is providing better contact with the community liaison officer and making sure that they have all of the contact information that they need uh, in order to facilitate you know, that working relationship. Um, I will say in terms of additional, impro additional improvements, um, I would have to, I'd have to go back and speak with yeah, the so community you, liaison officer for this one. But, but I think ultimately it's very much needing to memorialize that because we have seen when, when that does not happen very frequently, um, unfortunately, things tend to fall back. It tends to be like, okay, cool, I checked a box. I got, I got the city to say, okay, you're good. And then a year later, we're back here. And in the meantime, X, Y, Z may have happened. And so uh, it, it very much is sort of closing the loop on that process. And uh, Council Member Brown, I'm, I'm glad you, you brought this up too, because I think where, where I am seeking to take this work in the future and our office is, is continued and uh, year-long engagement with these, with these owners so that we can potentially head some of this off before we reach the end of the year. I think that we've, we've already throughout this year begun, I think, better outreach with market owners and started those conversations, connected market owners with community members and with police. And I look forward to see where those discussions go, I think, moving forward so that um, we can start even memorializing these things in good neighbor agreements, potentially before they even reach okay. objection. Uh, thank you, Ms. Pomeroy. And, and I appreciate and in talking to you, I know that you are serious about those outreach efforts. And I want, if council can be helpful in those and in the part that the city can play, I think that's important. I want the business owners to know um, that, you know, this, we all have to attack these public safety um, problems together. Um, so thank you, Councilmember Brown. Thank, thank you, you Councilmember. Um, very, very important question. It's significant that we provide, obviously, law enforcement the tools, but subsequently the engagement of the business community to help and make things happen when they're showing positive engagement, then certainly our city attorney's office and law enforcement recognize that, uh, but they do need to hold them appropriately accountable. So thank you. If there are no objections, I move for adoption. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorn's favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you. Adopted. I have also 0216. Uh, Mr. Chair. Pardon uh, me, sir. We need to pause for zoning. Yep, it's it 6, is 6.30. Yes, sir. Would you wish to? Yeah, we'll pause and then we'll come back. That's, that's really fine with me, Council President. Uh, if there are no, uh, is there a motion to uh, adjourn? Uh, recess, I apologize. Clerk, please call the, re uh, please call the road to recess. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Meeting is recess.
Regular meeting number 52 will now come to order. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor. Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor. Remy Tyson, President Hardin. We'll now go to the zoning committee. Councilmember Tyson chairs the committee. All members serve on it. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Before beginning the zoning agenda, I'll briefly explain the rules of council as pertaining to speaking um, before council on zonings and variances. We, we, we permit three speakers on each side, three proponents and three opponents, and we ask that they limit their remarks to three minutes on each side. And we provide an opportunity for rebuttal from the applicant. On the advice of the city attorney's office, anyone, anyone who wishes to speak for or against any council variance, including staff, must be sworn in prior to getting testimony. We do so prior to beginning the reading of each variance. Will the clerk now read the ordinance numbers of those items that require a waiver of second reading? Ordinances 2580, 2860, 2862, 2884, 2886, 2895, 2896, and 2897-2021. I move to waive second reading on these ordinances. Right. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor. Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Waived. Thank you. The first ordinance is a variance. It's variance 2580-2021. Anyone here this evening who wishes to speak either for or against this council variance, including staff, Please stand, raise your right hand, and be sworn in. I wish to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Please answer, I will. I will. Thank you. This ordinance is to 2580 to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3332.025 RRR, Restricted Rural Residential District, 3332.08 RRR, Area District Requirements, and 3332. Point 19 fronting of the Columbus City Codes were properly located at 1920 Williams Road to permit a 5,000 square foot commercial storage building and a single unit dwelling with reduced development standards in the RRR Restricted Rural Develop Residential District. The applicant is Corlin Properties LLC, care of John Stevenson, attorney. The proposed use is a single unit dwelling and commercial storage building. The city department's recommendation is approval and the Far South Air Commission's recommendation is approval, nine to zero. I now will ask for a staff presentation. Good evening. The site is developed with a single unit dwelling in the RRR Restricted Rural Residential District. The applicant requests a council variance to permit the construction of a 5,000 square foot commercial storage building with a lot split to create separate lots for the existing single unit dwelling and the proposed storage building. Variances to lot area and fronting are included in this request. The site is located within the boundaries of the South Alum Creek Neighborhood Plan, which recommends manufacturing and industrial land uses at this location. Additionally, the plan includes adoption of the Columbus Citywide Planning Policies Design Guidelines. Staff finds that the proposal will not add an incompatible use to the area, and additional landscaping and screening will be provided along the frontage of BAME Road to mitigate impacts on adjacent residential uses. Therefore, the staff's recommendation is for approval. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pine. Are there any questions for Ms. Pine? Thank you, seeing none, I accept the entire report into evidence as an exhibit. I move to adopt the findings of the staff and findings of council. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorn's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Adopt it. Thank you, I now move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor. Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you. Ordinance 2860-2021 to rezone 5600 Village Ch Channel Drive being 45.4 acres located at the south side of 
Shannon Row, 360 feet east of Shannon Green Drive from the PUD-8 Plan Unit Development District to PUD-8 Plan Unit Development District. The applicant is Miranda Holmes, LLC, care of attorney Rebecca Mott. The proposed use is a residential development. The C department's recommendation is approval and the Greater Southeast Air Commission's recommendation is approval seven to zero. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorns, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you. The next ordinance is a variance, a variance 2862-2021. Anyone here this evening who wishes to speak either for or against this council variance, including staff, please stand, raise your right hand, and be sworn in. I wish to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Please answer, I will. I will. Thank you. This ordinance is to grant a variance from, from the provisions of sections 3356.03 permitted uses and, 30, and section 3311.28b requirements of the Columbus e Codes for property located at 1281 Oxley Road to permit a wholesale, wholesale packaging operation with reduced development, um, reduced uh, distance separation from residentially zoned property in the C4 commercial district. The applicant is Timothy Washington. The proposed use is wholesale packaging and the city department's recommendation is approval. And the fifth by Northwest Air Commission's recommendation is approval five to zero. I'd like to now have a staff presentation. This site consists of one parcel developed with a single unit dwelling and several attached industrial buildings in the C4 commercial district. The requested council variance will permit a wholesale packaging operation for hemp products within a tenant space of an existing commercial building. The variance is necessary because the wholesale packaging of hemp is listed as a more objectionable manufacturing use that must be located in the M or M1 manufacturing district, at least 600 feet from residentially zoned property. A variance to reduce the distance separation requirement to 20 feet is also included noting that the proposed use will be located on the site's West Third Avenue frontage, approximately 130 feet from the adjacent residential district. The site is located within the boundaries of the 5th by Northwest area plan, which recommends medium density mixed residential land uses at this location. Additionally, the plan includes adoption of Columbus citywide planning policies design guidelines. While the proposed use is inconsistent with the land use recommendation of the plan, Planning Division staff recognizes that the existing uses on the site are commercial in nature and the request is supportive of the existing uses. No site changes are proposed and the existing building will be reused. Staff supports the distance separation reduction as the operation is limited to the packaging and wholesale of hemp and does not include more intensive manufacturing, compounding, or treatment processes. Therefore, the City Department's recommendation is for approval and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pine. Are there any questions for Ms. Pine? Seeing none, I accept the entire report into evidence as an exhibit. I now move to adopt the findings of staff as the findings of council. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorn's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Adopted. Thank you, and now I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorn's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you. The next ordinance is 2884-2021 to rezone 4559 Knights Bridge Boulevard, being 5.21 acres located at the north side of West Henderson Road, 300 feet west of Knights Bridge Boulevard from CPD Commercial Plan Development District to CPD Commercial Plan Development District. The applicant is Continental Tennis LLC, care of Jason Hoxack, who was the agent. The proposed use is a recre is recreation and sporting facility. The city department's recommendation is approval and the Northwest Civic, Air, Civic Association's recommendation is also approval eight to zero. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorn's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you. The next ordinance is a, uh, is a variance and it's variance 2885 and anyone here this evening who wishes to speak either for or against this council variance, including staff, please stand, raise your right hand, and be sworn in. I wish to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Please answer, I will. Thank you. The variance is, um, this ordinance is to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3333.03, 
AR3 apartment residential district use 3312.25 maneuvering 3312.272 parking setback line 3312.29 parking space and 3312.49 minimum numbers of parking spaces required 3321.05 a vision clearance and 3333.255 perimeter yard of the Columbus codes for property located at 3710 Elkin Road to permit parking lots as a principal use and reduce development standards for a multi-unit residential development in the AR3 apartment residential district. The applicant is American Community Developers Incorporated, care of Adam Saeed, attorney. The proposed use is a parking lot and reduce development standards for um, existing multi-unit residential development. The city department's recommendation is approval and the Greater Hilltop Air Commission's recommendation is also approval 13 to zero. I would now like to have a staff presentation. This site consists of three parcels developed with a multi-unit residential development zoned in the AR3 apartment residential district. The requested council variance will accommodate a lot split to create four new parcels for the existing apartment complex for refinancing purposes, necessitating a variance to allow a parking lot as a principal use on two of the proposed new lots with te technical variances for internal perimeter yard, vision clearance, and parking related standards. The proposed lot configuration will result in the existing apartment buildings on parcels two and four with parking lots and undeveloped land on parcels one and three for potential future development. The site is located within the planning area of the Hilltop Land Use Plan, which recommends high density residential land uses for this location. Additionally, the plan includes adoption of C2P2 design guidelines. Staff supports the requested variances as the C2P2 design guidelines prioritize development that utilizes existing infrastru infrastructure within urban and established suburban neighborhoods. Staff also recognizes the potential for new development within the site and the need to facilitate refinancing for needed repairs that ensure the site's ongoing viability as an affordable housing development. The technical variances required for splitting the property into four separate lots are routine with similar requests being approved by city council and the board of zoning adjustment. Therefore, the city department's recommendation is for approval and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pine. I accept the entire report into evidence as an exhibit. There is a speaker that is for this project and it is Adam Saeed. I, Mr. Saeed, do you wanna come and speak? You do not need to speak. All right, thank you. <laughs> so I move to adopt the findings of the, of the staff as the findings of council. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorns, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Adopt it. Thank you. I'd now like to move to amend to emergency. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorns, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Amend it. Thank you. And now I'd like to move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you. The next ordinance is 2886-2021 to rezone 800 Hilliard and Rome Road being 103.20 acres located at the northeast corner of Hilliard and Rome Road and, and Manor Park Drive from the R Rural District and the, a, and the R1 Residential District to the LM Limited Manufacturing District. The applicant is TPA Ventures LLC, care of Jeb Breeze. The proposed use is an industrial park. The proposed use is an industrial park. The city department's recommendation is approval. And the Far West Side Air <coughs> Commission's recommendation is 601. If there are no questions or comments from my colleagues, I will move for passage. Next, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Thank you. The next ordinance is 2895-2021 to amend ordinance 2252-2021 passed September the 20th of 2021 for property located at 1599 Alum Creek by repealing section two and replacing it with a new section two to correct the height district for CPD commercial plan development district. This is an ordinance amendment. The proposed amendment corrects section two, which had the incorrect height of 35 feet instead of the intended 110 height district. The city department's recommendation is approval. The Columbus South Site Air Commission's recommendation is also approval. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. 
Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Thank you. The next ordinance is 2896-2021 to rezone 725 Bellows Avenue being 1.63 acres located at the south side of Bellows at the terminus with South Green Street from the LC2 Limited Commercial District to the L. ARO Limited Apartment Office District. The applicant is Juliet Bullock, architect's care of Juliet Bullock agent. The proposed use is a mixed use development. The city department's recommendations approval and the Franklinton Area Commission's recommendation is also approval 14 to 01. I would now like to have a staff presentation. <coughs> The site consists of one parcel developed with a former school building that was to be converted into an office building in the LC2 Limited Commercial District. The requested LARO Limited Apartment Office District will permit the existing building to include 9,403 square feet of office space on the lower level and 27 apartment units on the upper levels with an additional 11 residential units to be constructed on this site. The site is within the boundaries of the uh, I'm sorry, the site is within the boundaries of the planning area of the West Franklinton plan, which recommends medium, high density, mixed residential uses at this location. Additionally, the plan includes adoption of C2P2 design guidelines. The proposal includes a commitment to develop the site in accordance with the attached site plan, which depicts dwellings at the northwest and southwest corners of the site, parking behind buildings, building design, street trees, and ample, ample bicycle parking as recommended by the plan and C2P2 design guidelines. A concurrent council variance proposes a use variance to permit the three single unit dwellings in the apartment residential office district and include standard variances for reduced building lines and perimeter yard and increased building height for the existing building. Staff's recommendation is for approval and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pine. Are there any questions for Ms. Pine? Thank you. Seeing none, is, uh, uh, is Ms. Bullock in the... I don't see the, as the, the applicant in council chambers. Okay. I do not see the applicant. And we do have one speaker, Mr. Bob Brennan, who is... Is, is she here? Mr. Brennan is here who is speaking against this project. This is the applicant of oh, this. Okay. All right. So I'm sorry. Please come to the podium. I have Ms. Bullock as the, the applicant, and so she's not here. So if you, if she, she represents you. Can you please come to the podium and can you state your name and who and who you represent? And you have three minutes to talk <clears throat> about this project. Okay. Uh, I'm representing 68 LLC. I remember, remember my name is Ezekiel Levy. And uh, originally we thought about converting this to an office building. Uh, with all this economy, we decided that residential is going to be better used. And this is why we're asking for this. It used to be, uh, we originally thought about doing it as an office building, and we decided just to change to residential. Mixed use of office residential. Okay. About 9,000 square foot of offices in the first floor and 27 units above. Yes. Again, state your name, who you represent, and you have three minutes. 
Thank you. My name is Robert Brennan. I represent both myself as a resident of 751 Campbell, which is just about across the street, just catty corner, as well as uh, neighbors, both on Bellows and Campbell, as well as uh, the company called Samadhi Home, who um, has properties directly on Bellows facing, including 726 facing uh, this. And uh, the, the neighbors also who have come to me, um, have, many of them have been there for over 30 years. This, this school was a school. It was a, it, this was a community plan school, and a school has its own function. And it's because of fire code, the school's been inactive. Everybody wants to see something happen, and uh, we hope something does happen. We sat through the Franklin <coughs> meeting. He talked about putting a fence, landscaping, and, and just dealing with the building itself, and people agreed to that. I didn't hear about the second meeting because uh, I never saw anything happen. He was supposed to put a fence. He was supposed to redo the his new landscaping. He was going to fix the parking lot and make it happen. Instead, that didn't happen, and now he's buying more time and instead wants to jam even more on there. So uh, since I don't have much time, uh, you've got to look at what he's putting there. Look at what he is putting. This is a residential. My street, Campbell, is a narrow street. Almost everybody on that street has had their vehicles damaged, including totaled by cars driving by. People cut through, and they cut up that alley. They cut through also Bellows. It's dangerous. There's children. There's toddlers there. And... Uh, there's already a limitation in parking because these houses were meant to have garages, but since, as you know, this has been a, this, most of those garages have been torn down. There's no garages. Everyone's trying to park on the street. It's crowded as it is, and there's still three abandoned houses just on that um, little street right there. Three abandoned houses. What happens when they fill up? And he wants to put all those townhomes and three individual homes and all the stuff in there. That is not proper. It is not, the city's not set up that way. We've got all kinds of empty lots. I know I'm for increasing the density. We've got a lot of opportunities for that. Um, so just so if, if it goes forward, um, there's a big concern. What are we going to do for the streets? How are you going to protect the children? How are you going to protect the vehicles? What are you going to do with the parking, which is already too tight? And uh, um, you know, are you going to put speed bumps? Are you going to do one-way roads? Are you going to expand the width of the roads? How are you going to deal with all of the additional noise? These, these people have been living here for 30-plus years, and all of a sudden you're just going to totally transform it. When East Franklin has still has huge lots, you've got the space for big development. You also have empty lots on that street for other kind of development. But this is just too much and too small a place. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Brennan? Thank you. No, no, I was asking if there any questions. Of Council Member Favor, please. Sir, you said you weren't aware of the community meeting? I just uh, heard you guys talking about it. Okay. I know, and then I see that it, it went through the Franklinton community meeting. I went, I went to the previous meeting. Mm -hmm. he, he was asking, but I, had, I did not see that meeting that come through. And what about all the residents that you said that you were also here representing? Do they know about that Franklinton the, Were meeting? they aware of the meeting as well? I, mean, I, I, I kind of doubt it. You know, I don't think that my neighborhood is very um, civically engaged, to tell okay. the truth. Um, but they're actually... Our, you know, there people have been living there. I've only lived there for four years, mm -hmm. but uh, most of those neighbors have been there for over 20 or 30 years. And there's some, it's a really great place, and there's little children. And uh, uh, Mr. Levi, I mean, the thing is, you bought the house right next across the alley. You bought that. That was a great grandpa running. He had over, he had so many people he was taking care of, and you were talking about how bad it looked, and you bought it. And he was a great grandpa taking care of his grandchildren and his so many people. And he kept it as good as he could. Maybe it looked a little hillbilly style, but he kept it good. You bought it and look at it now. There's rats crawling around. There's garbage been over there for Would so you, long. Would uh, you so talk I mean, to that's it. not relevant, but it is actually directly right yeah, next to Yeah, approach the desk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brennan. And thank so, you. Thank you. Okay, excuse Sorry. me. So what we're going to do is we'll now have this, have the the uh, applicant please come to the podium, and so you certainly heard the comments from Mr. Brennan. Can you please address tell exactly <clears throat> what's you know what's going to be on the property, and that um, and any of the and the issues that Mr. Brennan brought up? Can you please address them? Yeah. Uh, Regarding this just property, this property has been abandoned for many, many years, like probably about 30 years. Uh, it's really 1.6 acres, so it's a very large property, have a very big uh, parking lot. And uh, 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 the architect and the city work about the additional condo that they wanted on Campbell Avenue 
and on this. I originally apply only for the building itself and the city and the neighborhood decided that they wanted to build more residential on the lot in order to make it like more feeling of residential. Uh, we have several meetings in the church in, in Franklin Town, with Franklin Committee, everybody was supporting it. It was a lot of neighbor came and everybody supporting, everybody good. Uh, I think what we try to do the property just to renovate it and make it habitable. And we think with residential in this area, it's ultimately the best thing to do. Uh, this part of the neighborhood, Campbell and all these, have a lot of neglecting houses uh, throughout this, but I think right now, everything is coming and cleaning up. So what we're doing is just, I think by, by having a residential over there and office on the first floor, we have plenty of parking, we have landscaping, and, and making on Campbell, and this is from the city, a request to have um, engineer traffic. Everybody look at this, and everybody saying that it's okay. So, so again, the parking will be on your property? Yes. And so, and then also in the plan, Ms. Pine, so we definitely have the landscaping on, the, on this property? Yes. So we, we, we have... Yeah. Ms. Yes, the, the site plan um, on the screen uh, in front of you is uh, included with the rezoning. They are committed to develop the site in accordance with the site plan, which was reviewed by the planning division. Okay. okay. Councilor Faber. Mr. Levy, what's your, your timeline look like? Because I, I know that you've got a lot of projects happening uh, around the city. The timeline is probably uh, finish the project in the next eight months. You're going to do this in eight months? At least we're going to start with a school with a single. I mean, it's going to be together. So it's probably about 12 months, I mean, from approval. And, and I'm sorry, can, can we go back to the residential? What, what are the, there's 27 units? 27 units on the school building. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be about 9,000 square foot, which is about 12 offices on the lower level, uh, handicap accessibility, elevator. Most of the units are going to be a one to two bedroom. Mm -hmm. It's going to be about, uh, I think, a 15, <coughs> a 16, one bedroom, and the rest of them is going to be two bedroom. And these will be market rate or? They are going to be market rate. Okay. I mean, it's a fairly expensive project because it's a historical building and, mm -hmm. and it's, mega develop. I mean, we already fixed it a lot, but right now, just to do the finishing. Okay. So the roof is new roof, new flooring, all the asbestos was removed. I mean, it was tremendous amount of asbestos. Okay. And you already have commitments for yes, the office yes. space? $250,000 for remediation with the, yes. No, for the office space. Yes. Everything is out right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Council in favor. And so this has had um, the approval of the city, has the approval of the Franklin Town Area Commission. Uh, Sir, so, so, so let's just, let's, uh, you so, stop, please, you, stop, thank you. So let's just, so. <laughs> On this property, again, it has all the approval of the, the area commission. Now, he's, so can you still speak to the, uh, any additional housing that will be on this property? It's going to be additional single family on the property. That's what the city wanted, just to put it on Campbell Avenue and a couple of them on, on Bellows. So total together, uh, can you see how many? Show the, um, show the, the site plan. Yes. So there are individual houses. There is the the, the school, the old school building, and there hap and, and is there parking, Miss Pine, for all, for for every you for the for the apartment units, as well as the housing. There is parking or garage space for them. Can you please speak to that? Yes, yes. So there are um, the the number of units and the office space require a total of 81 parking or 80 parking spaces 81 parking spaces are provided 
There is no parking variance associated with this request. Um, the planning division, when they evaluated this, uh, at first there were no dwelling units at the northwest corner of the site, and there were uh, a mixture of one and two unit dwellings along the Campbell frontage, but the planning division had suggested so that this fits better into the development that they place dwelling units at the northwest corner. So that's where the three dwelling units came into play with the use variants that we'll be discussing next. And then they decided to do an eight unit townhouse style building on the southwest corner, uh, just so that there would be a presence of dwellings along that frontage, since there's nothing right now except the back of the school building. Councilman Favor has um, an additional question. Councilman Favor. So, Ms. Pine, there are 11 single family dwellings and 27 apartments planned. Am um, I re looking at that right? Yes, three, I would say three single unit dwellings, an eight unit townhouse building, which may or may not be sold as individual units. Uh -huh. um, that's not part of this proposal. Um, and then the 27 apartment units within the school building. So, 38 units total. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? All right. And again, um, again, this is a mixed use development. We have a C's department's recommendation and Franklin to the Air Commission of 1401. Based upon the, um, and again, um, based upon hearing the presentation from Ms. Pine, listening to the applicant, I'm going to move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you. The next ordinance is a variance. So anyone here this Thank evening you. who wishes to speak either for or against this council variance, including staff, please stand, raise your right hand, and be sworn in. I wish to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Please answer, I will. I will. It's ordinance number 2897-2021. It is to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3333.04 permitted uses and the ARO apartment office district 3333.18 building lines and 3333.255 perimeter yard and 3333.26 height district of the Columbus C. Coates are property located at 725 Bellows Avenue to permit a single unit, single unit dwellings and reduce development standards for mixed use development in the LARO limited apartment office district. The applicant is Juliet Bullock, architect's care of Juliet Bullock agent. The proposed use is mixed use development. The city department's recommendation is approval and the Franklinton Air Commission's recommendation is approval 1401. I would now like to ask for a staff presentation. The applicant has received a recommendation of approval from staff and the development commission for a concurrent rezoning to the LARO limited apartment office district. This proposal will allow a mixed use development, including 9,403 square feet of office space on the lower level and 27 apartment units on the upper levels of an existing building with the new construction of an eight unit apartment building and three single unit dwellings. The requested council variance will permit the single unit dwelling use and include standard variances for reduced building lines and perimeter yard and increased building height for the existing building. Staff finds the requested variances to be supportable as they will allow a site design that better integrates the proposed plan with the existing residential development pattern while achieving Columbus citywide planning policies design guidelines. Therefore, the city department's recommendation is for approval and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pine. Are there any questions for Ms. Pine? I accept the entire report into evidence as an exhibit. And I move to adopt the findings of the staff uh, as the findings of council. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Accepted. Thank you. I now move for passage. <coughs> Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. 
Thank you. And the uh, final ordinance is 1405-2021. And this is again a, a, um, a variance. Anyone here this evening who wishes to speak either for or against this council variance, including staff, please stand, raise your right hand and be sworn in. I wish to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Please answer, I will. Um, this ordinance is to 1405 is to grant a variance from provisions of sections 3332.289, prohibited, use, prohibited uses and activities, and 3332.21D2 building lines of the Columbus Sea Codes for property located at 3351 Carl Road to permit shipping containers for accessory storage with reduced development, reduced building lines in the R3 residential district. The applicant is Gary Hartman. The proposed use is shipping containers for accessory storage. The city department's recommendation is disapproval, and the Northland Air Commission's recommendation is disapproval five to zero. Um, I will now ask for a well, a staff presentation. The lot is developed with a single unit dwelling and a detached garage in the R3 residential district. There are two existing shipping containers adjacent to the garage for which a zoning code violation was issued in September 2020. The applicant proposes to legitimize the existing conditions for the containers to be used for accessory storage. A council variance is necessary to allow the use of salvaged shipping containers on, for storage on a residential lot. A variance is necessary to uh, also reduce the building line along Urena Avenue from 10 feet to 7 feet for the shipping containers and to zero feet for the existing dwelling, which are both included in this request. The site is located within the planning boundaries of the North Linden Neighborhood Plan Amendment, which recommends low to medium density residential land uses at this location. Staff does not support this request, noting that the use of shipping containers on a residential lot as accessory structures for the storage of personal property is not consistent with the residential character of the neighborhood. There is currently a working draft of an update to the zoning code that will explicitly prohibit the use of shipping containers as accessory structures on residential lots as they are industrial in nature and incompatible with the neighboring residential properties. Staff encourages the owner to instead utilize sheds or similar outbuildings which are permitted and because they are more ordinarily appurtenant to a dwelling and more compatible with the neighborhood. Therefore, the city department's recommendation is for disapproval and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Pine. Are there any questions? Seeing none, I um, first would like to move to take this from the table. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Move from the table. Thank you. And I just will add one comment that I have been certainly have been working with Director Messer, who now obviously who is um, who leads the uh, Department of Zoning as well as in code enforcement is now a part of that department. And they are working with Mr. Hartman and working with um, the city to try to, you know, resolve this issue um, regarding um, this particular variance and with Mr. Hartman. And so uh, as we continue to work with Mr. Hartman in this regard, I would ask to table this indefinitely. That's awesome. Clark, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Uh, tabled indefinitely. Thank you. And that concludes the zoning agenda. Uh, seeing no further business coming for the zoning committee, is there a motion to adjourn? Clark, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Adjourn. We'll reconvene in five minutes for a regular meeting.
favor, Rene Tyson, President Hardin. We are currently in the Safety Committee. Councilmember uh, Brown chairs that committee. Uh, Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President. Also, as we finish up the uh, liquor objections, I have uh, Resolution 0216X2021 to object to the renewal of liquor permit number 6548277 held by 1714 Zettler LLC doing business as Parkview Bar located at 5200 Riding Club Lane, Columbus, Ohio. I do have a speaker on this subject, on this objection, Miss Asia Majors. Is she still here? I don't see her present. Miss Pomeroy, the floor is yours. Thank you. In June of 2021, the city objected to a permit transfer request at this location. Uh, it has not yet been set for a hearing, much like a handful of our others this evening. Um, the objection was lodged due to concerns both uh, from the Columbus Police Patrol and community members due to shootings and weapons offenses uh, at this location. There were also frequent incidents of felony theft at this location, more so uh, triple more than any of the other locations uh, that we have tonight, uh, and additional disturbances. Uh, additional runs to the location include intoxicated persons needing assistance and uh, additional loud noise complaints. I will note the calls for service at this location uh, seem relatively low at 32. However, there are also 35 specific police reports. So you, ha you have um, calls for service to a location and then whether or not there's a documented police report at a location. Sometimes those numbers differ. Usually it's more calls for service than documented full police reports. Uh, this is a location where the police reports actually outnumber the number of calls for service, meaning that um, the vast majority of the calls here merited, uh, mer merited police reports and there were additional ones beyond calls. I bring that up uh, to say that we have only just literally very in, the, in this last week started discussions with the ownership of this location. Mm -hmm. um, however, given the activity and the fact that we already have an outstanding mid-year objection, we're asking for the uh, renewal objection this evening. If there are no objections from my council colleagues, I move for adoption. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorn's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Adopted. Also, thank you, Council President. Also, I have Resolution 0217X 2021 to object to the renewal of liquor permit number 0023900 held by Abdullah Mark Inc. doing business at Saveway Mini Mart located at 2585 West Broad Street. I do have a speaker with regard to this legislation, a Mr. Steve Nolder. Mr. Nolder, as you approach the podium, please state your full name, your address, and any affiliation you have with Saveway Mini Mart, and you have three minutes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank My you. name is Steve Nolder, N-O-L-D-E-R, and I'm an attorney here in Columbus, 65 East State Street, 43215 is the uh, zip code, and I do represent uh, Saveway Mini Mart. And I know that I'm walking into a stiff headwind uh, to oppose uh, uh, Sarah's uh, motion to uh, to oppose the uh, liquor permit, but I will oppose it nonetheless. If I can tell you a little bit about uh, my client, uh, the Saveway Mini Mart, Abdullah Ansar and his family have been in the convenience store business in Columbus for 30 years. They currently own three stores. This is one of those. They own a store in Victorian Village and Groveport, as well as this one, which is at the corner of West Broad Street and Burgess. And the answers have seen this neighborhood deteriorate over the last 18 months or so, and uh, no doubt due to the pandemic, but also the demographics in the neighborhood. And one of the issues that the Ansar saw as problematic, and they sought to uh, address it themselves, would have been the number of loiterers that they found on this property. In one way, they're blessed in the sense that there's a large parking lot with this property, but that also became a very big problem because of the number of loiters and the wrongdoers that Columbus police had encountered. And so the answers would try to run these people off their property and the people would then hop on the sidewalk and say, you can't do anything to us because we're not on your property. So they played that cat and mouse game for probably six months or so. Then they engaged their community liaison officer, it's Officer Cody, and Officer Cody gave them some pretty good pointers as far as how to address this issue. 
And Officer Cody thought it was very important that the Ansars would install some fencing. And so immediately west of this building where the Ansars have had this community or this uh, mini mart for about three years is a vacant building. And there's an alleyway, a passageway between the two buildings. And so Officer Cody suggested they put fencing in. They did. Then Officer Cody also suggested down the entire length of Burgess where this property uh, runs uh, that they put fencing along that way, as, uh, that, that sidewalk as well, to prohibit these loiters from easily gaining ass access to their parking lot. They did that too. Four feet high fencing, uh, chain link fencing down the entire perimeter of the building was placed, and that was met by the wrongdoers by stamping it down so it's flat. So they rebuilt the fence. They added this another two foot high section. Now it's six feet high. And that worked pretty well until Halloween when the wrongdoers knocked that fencing down as well. They rebuilt that fencing. And the purpose of the fencing and the importance of it was it funneled all the traffic, both foot traffic and car traffic, into one area so it could be easily monitored by the answers from inside the store. And that's helped quite a bit, I will say that. And the, the fencing was complete sometime in the latter part of the summer. The Ansars, since they bought the property in 2018, they added uh, security cameras or two or three total in this entire perimeter of this building that keeps an eye on all, all the things that are going on. I guess that's- Please continue, minute. Mr. Nolder, go ahead. Okay, but, and that keeps an eye on whatever is going on in this, the parking lot. They've added uh, high grade uh, security uh, lighting as well that's illuminated the parking lot. Bulletproof glass has been added on the entire uh, outside of the, uh, the structure as well. They've asked for an increased police presence and, and they have partnered with the police in, in increasing patrols to the extent possible. Last Friday, uh, the answers and I uh, met with uh, Detective Gant and Sarah at their office. We had a very productive meeting and there's some issues that uh, I think that uh, the city attorney's office would like us to to explore and implement, and that may even go a longer way to solving the problems. But I think also they've been so proactive in approaching this issue. The answer is in, in January of this year, before this issue was on their radar screen, they became involved in their community. Every month, or, or, yeah, every month they have a food drive. Every month they have a clothing drive. And so they've invested a lot of money in their property. They're proud of how their property appears, how they serve their marginalized community. They've tried to help the community out by, with, with food drives and clothing drives. And I would ask this body to oppose Sarah's request at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Notre. Ms. Pomeroy. Thank you. And yes, uh, so uh, to reiterate what Attorney Nolder did say, we did meet on Friday, I think started a, a good discussion about um, the concerns that uh, the Columbus police have had, the community has had. I will say that this objection is supported by uh, a significant number of, of police runs to this location, uh, including felony assaults, shots fired, a stabbing, person suffering from overdoses at this location, narcotics complaints, uh, additional weapons offenses. Uh, Columbus Fire has responded to this location for seven different incidents of persons suffering from overdoses in this last year. Um, one of the violations, unfortunately, at this location also included both combined between the Columbus Police and Ohio Investigative Unit, the confiscation of drugs and drug paraphernalia that was actually at the counter um, from the owner. So that, that was a, a, one of the handful of, of, of incidents that, at the very least, make this place still a concern. And I, and I look forward to continuing these discussions with, with this owner. I, I think Ultimately, though, an objection is merited here based on the activity that has happened. The Greater Hilltop Area Commission has also supported, uh, submitted a letter, I think, in support of this objection this evening. Uh, and I, th I think ultimately, based on this activity, even though we've started these discussions, this is an example of where uh, 
an objection is still merited based on what has happened here in this last year. Uh, but as our office always does, we will continue to engage this owner and talk through what additional um, improvements can be made, potentially security, uh, the stopping of the sale of anything that could be used for drug paraphernalia. Um, and then the final note that I will make is uh, from my meeting last week with the, uh, with the owner of this business, they expressed that a number of their uh, improvements were made back in 2020. Uh, the calls for service at this location have almost doubled, however, from 2020 to 2021. So there's still, I think, some room here where I think we can try and make this an even safer location. So therefore, we uh, are asking that the objection be granted. Councilman Tyson. Thank you, Chair Brown. I have a couple questions. The first, you just mentioned there's been, I think, drug and drug paraphernalia. Did you say at the counter? Yes. Yeah, so one of one of the incidents involved the confiscation of, I believe it was marijuana and then other drug paraphernalia from behind the counter that was um, owned by the the. I think it, I believe it was the owner working at that time. I, I can defer to Detective Gann if, uh, for more details from that specific incident. Um, but that was confiscated when they were there conducting an additional um, over in, in inspection of the location. And unfortunately, yeah, it was confiscated from the employee working at that time, who I believe was the owner at that specific date. Um, but again, I would have to defer to Detective Gant, who was there. And would that be the current owner? That's, that's yes. been the current owner. Okay. That's, of course, that's not appropriate. But um, the other question, this is just an overall question. So um, it, the attorney that spoke for his client today certainly stated all the that, that, that they were certainly working to try to improve the property. And uh, so based upon those kinds of things happening, I would just ask the city attorney, just your opinion, if they are, you know, working to put fencing up and working to, um, not just something as a food and clothing drive, that's, a, that's just being a good participant in the community. But I would like to find out now, what, what kinds of things would you, as you're talking to this particular client and, and, and others we've heard today, what would you, you know, when, when they come in to meet with you, what would your recommendation be, especially in regard to some of the issues that is going on with this particular client? Absolutely. I think first uh, it would be making sure that they're, they are um, potentially refraining from the sale of any items that could be used in terms of drug paraphernalia. Uh, even though it might be legal, I think there, there's CBD products and potentially even single-serve beverages that actually might cut down on, on the fact that folks are just are coming to that location and hanging out on that lot. Um, that's often a suggestion that we've already made to, to this owner as well as we make to other owners. Uh, the last suggestion that we already have discussed and I think could be beneficial to explore is um, adding addi an additional security presence. And we, we also have discussed both with this owner and many others that there's an opportunity potentially to pool between a couple places to split the cost of that. I, that's something that we're just sort of starting to explore. But um, those are suggestions that we made. And I think the, the last piece of it is what I mentioned earlier is that um, needing to codify this in some way and, and uh, obviously they've made a, a show of good faith for what they have already done. The problems have persisted, and so I believe the fencing was only a relatively recent development, so I think we're, we're sort of in the middle of this process, but there are still some concrete steps that the city attorney's office certainly feels they can take. So is it your belief, for an example, you're saying that there should be you know, additional security presence, not only maybe this facility, people could pool their dollars and have security. Do you believe that having that additional security presence would Stop, I'm just saying, the felony assault, the fights, shots, shots fired, stabbing a person, the drug overdoses. Is it your thought that having that presence, those things would not happen? We can never 100% guarantee that it will make things completely go away. However, yes, I do believe it will absolutely help in cutting into this significantly. And what we have found is that largely what has been the problem over this last year and a half has been markets more so than even than even bars and a lot of it is a lot of loitering a lot of use of the lot for various activities and in our discussions that we've already had with business owners and that we will continue to have I think the number one thing it always comes back to is we need to keep people moving and moving off the lot the, the more that you uh, allow individuals to stay there I think that 
contributes to them feeling like, oh, I own this location versus a property owner who is actively either contributing to security to get folks off their lot or doing it themselves to continue to remove people off. And I recognize that, that is not an easy proposition for a clerk who's working solo to go outside and tell someone to leave who may have a, you know, a weapon. Um, however, that needs to be part of the calculus in owning a business. Uh, and that's why we've, we've started to explore security uplifts and um, potentially additional employees to help with this. Okay, well, thank you. The reason I think that was, I wanted to ask that question is because if people began to invest in their businesses in the way that you're suggesting when they had their sessions with you, uh, I think that's important to have a solution if, it's, if they're able to afford that solution so, um, so that they can continue to have a viable business and, um, um, and, and still continue to contribute to our community. So thank you. Thank you, Council President. I mean, <laughs> Council Tyson. Uh, Detective Gant, would you like to comment on this issue as well? I mean, from the perspective of the PAC unit, the role and the questions that Councilmember Tyson just asked, I think it's significant for you to give some clarity to the role in which law enforcement plays with regards to that circumstance. Uh, I apologize. Uh, Thank you for having me. Uh, Councilmember Council Tyson, why don't you ask the detective that exact same question, please? Thank you, Councilmember Brown. and. Um, Detective, I was just asking, you know, we, we just heard from um, our, um, our attorney here that it was important that when I asked her the question, if we were, cause she mentioned that if individuals had more of a uh, safety presence, whether they pooled their dollars to bring, you know, whether it be police, off-duty police, or they bring in their security team, someone that would be able to help with these things that we're saying, you know, the assaults, the shots fired, the stabbings, the drugs, and et cetera, et cetera, that if they did those things, you know, would they begin to see, you know, obviously a difference in terms of these issues happening within their locations? Because I think we want to be able to make sure we're having positive solutions to some of these issues that we're hearing today. And so I think Councilman Brown wanted you to be able to share having that extra safety presence on that on those at their at their businesses would what that would mean for them. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the question. Uh, I believe that officer presence would make a difference, whether or just security, because again, people that I, I basically after almost 27 years of experience, when they see uniformed personnel, whether it be law enforcement or security, they generally more or less think twice about doing anything criminal. So I, I believe uh, it was a new process brought up to me when I came up to the PAC unit about businesses pulling together their resources because it is an expensive uh, addition. Uh, so I've talked with other people at meetings. Uh, we had three separate meetings last uh, this past summer for like the Linden area and whatnot, and they've brought these things up as well. And it, it seems to have helped their businesses. So I believe that it would make a difference. Thank you. Councilman Dorns. Uh, <coughs> the business owner's uh, attorney mentioned that they operate markets in other parts of the city and certainly other parts of the uh, central Ohio and have not had you know these kinds of issues. Obviously, those markets are located in areas of the city that don't have sort of consistent um, problems uh, as far as the entire community as it relates to crime. Um, just wanted to sort of ask a question in general. You know, one of the things that we've talked a lot about here tonight is sort of the um, owners making the effort to, to do the right thing and, and try to make sure that they're doing everything they can to make their store, you know, safe um, and, you know, not a problem for the community. I'm just curious, you know, does the city attorney's office sort of take that into account when they are operating other locations in other places and have not had a history of any, any of those kinds of issues. Um, again, thinking through what we've experienced the last, you know, 18 plus months in certain areas of the city where we've seen, you know, increases in crime in general, not just at these particular locations. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I think a, any sort of effort that a business owner is going to put forward is, is going to matter in, in terms of how, as part of this process, some of that is that the communication is not necessarily there. There's, I think, certainly historically, and, and, and we've been trying to be a little bit better about this, there's been a disconnect between um, the, the business owners, the community leaders, like the area commission, and then, um, and then police. And I think that what, what our office is trying to do is, is bridge those divides a little bit better so that we hear about some, some of what 
they may already be doing ahead of time. Uh, I will say, A, uh, most, the vast majority of these places, even if they may be owned um, by the same handful of people, are usually under different names. So we do not always know exactly who might be the specific owner of each, place, each location. So that, that is sometimes a challenge on our part. And I think one of my goals certainly is to, is to try and get a better sort of accounting of which, which uh, people own what so that we can talk to them more globally, even you know, about more than just one location. And then I think the last thing I would mention is, uh, yes, obviously, different areas of the city uh, have different levels of crime, have, have been hit in a different way by these last 18 months. And I think one of the things that we're looking for in these discussions with owners is that um, they, as business owners in that community, do have potentially a different responsibility depending on where, like what location that they own a business in. And I think uh, hearing that the owner of Safeway has started uh, monthly community events at, at their location. I think that that's great. That may not be needed at another location, but I think that also goes to, you have to think about security in a different way, depending on which area of the city you might be in. Thank you very much. Councilmember Brown. Um, thank you, Councilmember. And uh, I appreciate, again, your commitment, Ms. Pomeroy, to um, sort of some more comprehensive solutions in future years to making sure the relationships are improved um, in communities among business owners, police, and community members. I do think that business owner and community member link is really important too. Obviously the link with law enforcement is, but the one that too often goes unspoken is the community member one. So I, in my meetings with you, I've heard that and I appreciate that. And um, I think that's important to the business community, too. And as much as the city can be doing to facilitate it, that's important. One of the things I've heard from the business community is a frustration that, um, you know, when there is a problem on their property and they, they try to call the police um, for help, but the police can't come because it's not a dangerous enough level. And so they don't necessarily, um, you know, get, get that help. And a 911 call is counted against them, you know, in these hearings as like calls for service that sort of uh, um, amass. And it just feels like a catch-22 for the business owners on exactly how to do the right thing in any given moment. So I don't think there's an easy answer at the, right now, but I just want to underscore how important it is that... Um, uh, we, we want these businesses to be successful in these neighborhoods, right? We want them to be positive additions to the community. We don't want to drive high business turnover because that then loosens any ties businesses can have with the community. And we don't want these properties to be totally vacated because only worse, you know, situations will arise there. And so I just am really interested in what the city can do to create some virtuous cycles, <laughs> you know, um, with what's going on at... Um, you know, there's 19 of these tonight, and not all of them are the same. Um, but I, I want to say that, you know, I am going to uh, support your recommendation because I've heard you that you really want to create, um, it, it, you really want to create this, these linkages in the community that will improve businesses and help the business owners, not penalize the business owners. But I, it's, it's hard work. So um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I would say uh, to Mr. Nolder, Attorney Nolder, to continue to discuss these issues with you. I think for all my colleagues to be aware, um, uh, Councilor Tyson was very, very uh, astute when she said over the counter. That means it's inside the establishment. Uh, that has to be addressed. And no matter how you deal with it. Uh, but uh, the talks will continue. But I am going to recommend that uh, we object to this liquor uh, Renewal. Uh, there are any comments from my colleagues? I move for adoption. Second. Brown, Brown, Dorns, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hardin. Uh, Council President, that's all the liquor licenses. <laughs> uh, I do have another ordinance that I'd like to carry on, sir. Uh, ordinance 3020-2021 to authorize the appropriation expenditure of $19,565.06 in the Public Safety Initiative Subfund for the Department of Public Safety on behalf of the Columbus Division of Police to participate in the Appalachian Law Enforcement Virtual Reality Training Initiative and to declare an emergency. 
This program will allow the Division of Police to, to participate in a study led by the Ohio University Voinovich School of Leadership and Public Service as part of the Appalachian Law Enforcement Initiative, which serves virtual reality uh, to study police responses to various scenarios. The Ohio University study will take police officers through various law enforcement scenarios virtually and study reactions. This program is designed for law enforcement to improve empathy and outcomes when working with the public, teaching them how to de-escalate mental health crises and to reckon with the effects of racial profiling in the black community. Uh, if there are no comments from my colleagues, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Council President, may I move on to Veterans and Senior Affairs, please? Please. Thank you. Uh, tonight I have Ordinance 2608, 2021, to authorize the director, uh, authorized and direct the Director of Recreation Parks to enter into contracts with 28 community agencies to provide social and nutrition services to older adults in Central Ohio during the 2022, to authorize the expenditure of $7,710,000 from the Recreation Parks Grants Fund and to declare an emergency. This is an annual allocation of funding, and I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Ms. Brown? By voice. By voice, I'm sorry. That's me. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorans? Yes. Ms. Favor? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. Ms. Tyson? Yes. President Hardin? Yes. That's all I have this evening, sir. Thank you <laughs> so much. It might be late tonight, but uh, we appreciate uh, getting it done early and not the last meeting of the year, so. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next committee to come before council is the uh, Public Utilities Committee. The committee is chaired by Councilmember Dorrance. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President. And yes, we appreciate that, Chair Brown. <laughs> First ordinance we have in the Public Utilities Committee is ordinance number 2680-2021 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter into a construction contract with the Writer Company, Inc. for the SWWTP Boiler System op Operational Improvement Project to authorize the appropriation of transfer of $1,024,560 from the Sanitary Sewer Reserve Fund to the Ohio Water Development Loan Fund to authorize the appropri appropriation expenditure of $1,024,560 from the Ohio Water Development Loan Fund to authorize the transfer within an expenditure of up to $2,000 for providing wage services to the Department of Public Services within the Sanitary General Obligation Voted Bond Fund and to amend the 2020 Capital Improvement Budget. This project will address some operational deficiencies at the Southerly Wastewater Treatment Plant, including the modification of chemical injection, operational improvements to the water feed tank, and upgrade of the combustion air system. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Definitely. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Next, we have ordinance number 2733-2021 to authorize the finance and management director to associate all general budget reservations resulting from this ordinance with the appropriate current and uh, pending universal term contract purchase agreements for the purchase of water treatment chemicals for the division of water to authorize the transfer of $3,400,000 between object classes and the water operating fund and to authorize the expenditure of $3,400,000 from the Water Operating Fund. Uh, cost increases associated with the pandemic and supply chain issues have led um, to the need to establish additional funding for the purchase of water treatment uh, chemicals that are necessary for the city to provide safe and healthy drinking water to all those that are served by the Department of Public Utilities. Do I have my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you. And uh, Council President, if you would indulge me for a moment before I move on to the Technology Committee, I'd like to introduce resolution number 023X-2021 from the floor to express gratitude and deep appreciation to Tracy Davies for her years and exceptional service to the people of the City of Columbus. Tracy Davies was named the Director of Public Utilities Department for the City of Columbus in January 2016 after previously serving as the Director of the Department of Public Service beginning in July of 2013. Originally, she joined the City of Columbus in 2008 as an Assistant Director of Development and became the first Director of Department of Building and Zoning Services in 2010. Director Zavi's steady leadership, especially in the midst of a global pandemic, has been critical to the city's growth and success as a region maintaining critical infrastructure, providing safe, clean drinking water while reducing our impact on the environment. 
As the director of public utilities, Davies worked to reduce sewer overflows and reduce the impact on waterways and also advance sustainable Columbus, playing a key role in advancing the goal of making Columbus carbon neutral by 2020. Director Davies leaves behind a legacy of exceptional leadership, um, of professionalism, and many friendships that will follow her to her future endeavors. Uh, I want to stop and really congratulate Director Davies for her lengthy career uh, here at the, at the city. Um, I still remember my first meeting with her, I think, the second day after I joined council. And uh, I, I'm not sure I had the pleasure of knowing her before that, but I walked out of that meeting thinking, that is one of the smartest people in the city government. And uh, during, those, during these past three years, she's done nothing but to prove me right in that. And it has been an absolute pleasure to work with her as chair of the Public Utilities Committee. Um, we are going to miss her, um, her professionalism and capability. I think you know, these last 19 months prove it. Um, when you talk about trying to balance the need for um, making sure that our, our water and sewer and, and electricity are, are, are funded while at the same time thinking about those who've been hit the hardest during the pandemic and Director Davies was uh, there every single day to try and balance those two concerns to do as much for um, the residents and the ratepayers as she possibly could to make, help challenge, um, help, help with these challenging times that everyone has been dealing with. Um, and I'm certainly gonna, gonna miss her uh, in our, our weekly uh, chat. She always would indulge me with my terrible stand-up comedy routine during our WebExes as we went through legislation, which at times can be a little dry, which we just went through. <laughs> um, but she's uh, surely gonna be missed. And uh, this was uh, supposed to be a little bit of a surprise, but in true uh, Tracy Davies fashion, um, she was trying to run out here the back door without anyone really noticing. So I think she got wind of this resolution tonight. So I, I did want to give an opportunity to, to her if she wants to share any, any comments. Uh, I think she's uh, joining us virtually right now. Director Davies. Thank you, Council Member Zorn, President Hardin, members of Council. Thank you for this resolution and your kind words. It really has been such an honor to serve the residents of Columbus. I'm so grateful for all of the opportunities I've had here at Columbus. This really was not an easy decision for me. Um, I want to thank all of Council for your support throughout the years, both personally and professionally. Um, I appreciate it more than you know. And I also want to take the opportunity to thank Mayor Ginther and all of my colleagues for their support and friendship throughout the years as well. Not goodbye, I'm just going up the road, so I will see you soon, and I thank you again. Well, thank you, Director, and I, I do want to pause because I know I have at least one uh, colleague that wants to say a couple words. Councilmember Brown? Thank you, Councilman Dorns. Uh, Tracy, uh, you know we talk a lot. Uh, our relationship has not only been a professional one, but a personal one. I will miss you tremendously. Uh, we worked together on some very, very complicated issues over the years, and uh, I could always rely on you, as you knew you could rely on me. Uh, you'll be missed, and uh, enjoy uh, the next phase of uh, your career. You take care. Thank you. Councilmember Tyson. Thank you, Councilman Dorns. Um, Director Davies, congratulations on your new opportunity. I'm sure you'll make a tremendous difference there. But you will surely be missed by, um, I will surely miss you. I know that I, whenever I would call you about a topic that you were always, first of all, easy to, easily accessible and then always prepared to give, a, um, to, to, to give a good rationale for any decision that was, has been made. And so I just really appreciate you, but I'm, look, I'm very excited about your new opportunity and just wish you the best of luck to you as well as to your family. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Tyson. President Harden. Thank you, uh, Chairman Rob uh, Dorrance, uh, for bringing this resolution to uh, my friend, to our colleague, uh, Director Davies. Um, I think true service comes with uh, the reality that there's going to be sacrifice. Um, and so tonight we say thank you for your service, but thank you for your sacrifices as well the ones that were known and the ones that were unknown, but all on behalf of the residents of this city. Uh, we are all grateful uh, for the work that you've done, especially in the last two years as we fought this pandemic. You kept water flowing um, to our, our residents, um, and that is no small task. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your friendship. And you are just up the road. 
Thank you, President Hardin. Um, again, congratulations on having your Monday nights back, uh, Director Davies. Even on a late, we managed to make sure your last meeting was a late one, so uh, we couldn't let you off too easy. Um, but again, thank you for your, your service and, and to President Hardin's comments. Um, I, I know some of the sacrifices that you've made of, of the, at least my time here, and it is appreciated um, even when folks don't know the time that you've put in to, to make that happen. So thank you for um, your work on behalf of, uh, on behalf of our residents. Uh, if there are no other comments by my colleagues, I first move to add resolution 023X-2021 to the tonight's agenda from the floor. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorn's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Add it. Thank you. And now I move for adoption. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorn's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Adopt it. Thank you. Um, President Hardin, I'd like to move on to the Technology Committee, if I may. Please. Thank you. And the Technology Committee, we have ordinance number 2416 2021 to authorize the Director of Management. The, to authorize the finance and management director to establish a purchase order slash contract on behalf of the Department of Technology using the Ohio State term schedule STS 033-53405, I'm sorry, 534605 with CDW Government LLC professional services to mitigate the city's current Cisco ASA and Juniper SRX 4100 platforms to a security solution leveraging the Palo Alto security platform to amend the 2020 capital improvement budget to authorize transfer and appropriation and cash between projects to waive the competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Code and to authorize expenditure of $16,980 for, for the above stated purpose. The uh, Palo Alto firewall refreshes projects is a major upgrade to the core city firewall services which provides all inbound and outbound internet connections to the city. Uh, the Department of Technology requests the waiver of, of relevant sections of Columbus City Codes pertaining to competitive bidding provisions in order to complete the final phase of the Paul Alto project. Do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Thank you. Uh, lastly, we have ordinance number 2822-2021 to appropriate $2 million within the Special Income Tax Fund to authorize the Director of Finance and Management on behalf of the Department of Technology to associate all general, uh, general budget reservations re resulting from this ordinance with the appropriate universal term contracts slash purchase agreements from Microsoft Enterprise Software Licensing to authorize the expenditure of $2 million from the Special Income Tax Fund to authorize the expenditure of $75,799.19 from the Information Services Operating Fund and to declare an emergency. Microsoft Office is the city's uh, technology standard for desktop, desktop computing software, currently used by approximately 7,500 city employees on a daily basis. The city also uses Microsoft's uh, software to support numerous applications. Passage of this ordinance will enable the city to obtain the latest versions of Microsoft software, utilizing a single agreement, agreement for the entire city. Do I my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you, Council President. That is all I have in my committees this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Next committee to come before Council is Public Service and Transportation. That committee is chaired by Councilmember Favor. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President Hardin. Tonight in Public Service and Transportation, we have Ordinance 2841-2021 to authorize the Director of Public Service to enter into grant agreements with Impact Community Action and Roads to Work to provide funding for the Pathways to Purpose Casey Goodson Jr. CDL program to authorize an expenditure within the recovery fund and to declare an emergency. For those who are unfamiliar with Casey Goodson Jr.'s story, Mr. Goodson was a young, devoted, and experienced CDL driver who had dreams of one day owning his own fleet. Unfortunately, those dreams were tragically cut short last December when he lost his life to law enforcement. Mr. Goodson's life mattered, and he had an incredibly bright future ahead of him as a truck driver. It is in that spirit that we are proud to introduce the Pathways to Purpose Casey Goodson Jr. CDL program, which was created to uplift Mr. Goodson's name by honoring the legacy of his life, by providing opportunities to individuals, regardless of their background, to be gainfully employed as a CDL driver, whether that is within the city of Columbus or with a private employer in the Central Ohio region. Currently, we are facing a local, regional, and nationwide shortage of drivers. Even here in Columbus, we have felt the effects of the shortage of trained drivers that can operate our school buses, 
Dakota buses, as well as our refuse and utility trucks. There are so many hardworking drivers like Mr. Goodson who are forced to overcome various barriers, including language and financial barriers to gain access to steady employment. Programs like this can be a game changer for not only developing a skilled workforce, but also creating pathways for the skilled workforce to advance their careers. This program would not be possible without the support of the Department of Public Service, Impact, Roads to Work, and most importantly, Ms. Tamela Payne, who has been a zealous advocate for justice for her son, Casey. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Capital Transportation President Richard Crockett to provide additional remarks if he's still on. Yes, I am. Good evening, um, Mr. Crockett. Good evening. Uh, thank you so much, um, President Hardin, uh, members of council. Um, my name is Richard Crockett and I'm uh, President, CEO of Capital Transportation Academy, and I am the founder of Roads to Work. Uh, program, I'd like to take a moment to say how honored I am to be a part of the Casey Goodson um, uh, program, CDL program, and I'd like to acknowledge and uh, thank uh, Council Person Favors for her uh, tremendous work in honoring uh, Mr. Goodson through the um, CDL program. Um, I um, been a part of this community for quite some time and recognize that there is a tremendous need right now for CDL drivers. And um, I founded uh, Roads to Work, a nonprofit, uh, 501c nonprofit organization uh, and workforce development program that focuses on um, commercial driver training and more importantly, uh, transportation related employment. Uh, for underserved communities, those individuals who are unemployed, underemployed, restored citizens that are returning from incarceration, uh, to truly have uh, an opportunity uh, to participate uh, in um, this current workforce uh, where CDL drivers are in such demand. And so through Roads to Work, uh, we're working and proud to partner uh, with the Casey Goodson CDL program uh, because it's a tremendous opportunity for individuals to transform their lives in a short period of time. Um, five weeks of training, uh, a week of soft skills training, uh, four weeks of uh, commercial driver training and provide the necessary skills to become a CDL driver, and then job placement. Um, as, you got, as you all have heard from council person favors that there is a tremendous shortage of CDL drivers not only in our community, but in uh, nationwide. And as a consequence of this driver shortage, individuals can become gainfully employed with livable wages of $65,000 a year plus benefit in an in-demand uh, profession. So it's a tremendous, tremendous opportunity. And I am so pleased and again, uh, an honor to be working as a partner with the uh, city council uh, with uh, Roads to Work uh, as well as our uh, soft skills partner community, um, uh, impact community action. And one of the, I guess, key things or takeaways for this is this is an opportunity for uh, Casey Goodston to create a legacy for those individuals in the community by, through this program, individuals becoming uh, CDL drivers, having a, a job skill and a career in his honor. And so we are so pleased again to be a part of that. And again, thank uh, city council as well as uh, council person favors and her staff for the hard work uh, in creating this program. And I truly had an opportunity to meet the family at the press conference last week. And it was truly an honor. Uh, and I indicated that it is an honor for us to be a part of this. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Crockett. We are incredibly excited to really get this program um, out to the community. Uh, that was very well received and uh, it, it just would not be possible without uh, the excellent work of my team, uh, Anissa Lieben, Naya Walters, and Tynesha Harden. I wanna thank you, the three of you, for all of the work that you all did to ensure that this program uh, would, would come to fruition and that we would be able to do some good work and as well as honor Mr. Goodson. Um, 
Are there any questions or comments by my, yes, Councilmember Brown. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Favor. Um, I would simply be remiss if I didn't take a moment to say uh, how engaged Richard Crockard has been over many, many years in, in this community uh, and his engagement with CDL training, uh, I know firsthand. And uh, th that program involving Mr. Casey Goodson is in, is in good hands and Rich's hands. And I really and truly appreciate it. Uh, I said, we've known each other for a long, long time and he's never not delivered. And I'm sure he's going to deliver significantly in this particular program. Five weeks to get a CDL is special. Uh, and being able to drive those large vehicles on our highways is really, really important. And uh, they, they're, they're learning from the best. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. Well, thank you all for your support of this effort. And uh, I would move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Asked. Thank, thank you for you. your leadership, Councilmember. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Ordinance 2917-2021 to authorize the Director of Finance and Management to associate all general budget reservations resulting from this ordinance with the appropriate universal term contract purchase agreement for the purchase of two single axle and three tandem axle live body dump trucks with snow equipment from the FYDA Freightliner Columbus to authorize the expenditure of up to $1,531,077 from the Municipal Motor Vehicle Tax Fund and to declare an emergency. The Department of Public Service, Division of Infrastructure Management, is responsible for maintaining Columbus roadways. This includes filling potholes, street sweeping, mowing, alley resurfacing, and snow and ice removal. The Division of Infrastructure Management has a need to purchase two single axle and three tandem axle live body dump trucks with snow and ice equipment for the purpose of maintaining the roads. Are there any questions or comments by my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. Thank you. Uh, Council President, may I move on to housing? Please. Tonight in housing, we have ordinance 2719-2021. This ordinance authorizes the Director of Development to enter with the Mapleside Homes LLC into an amended loan agreement, amended promissory note, and amended mortgage with Mapleside Homes LLC for the purpose of allowing no cash flow payment to be made to the city in 2020 for operations in 2019. Mapleside Homes LLC received a $300,000 home loan from the city on July 16, 2004 to construct a 24-unit single-family scattered site affordable housing development in the Linden and Milo Grogan neighborhoods. In April 2020, the housing division reached out to project owners who had not yet made a cash flow payment in 2020 to allow them upon request to defer making the payments. Due to the sudden onset of COVID and the loss of many jobs due to shutdowns, affordable rental projects like Mapleside were negatively impacted with the loss of rental collections. While rental assistance has been provided, there has been a delay between the income loss occurred and the rental assistance provided. For Mapleside Homes, the request is to waive the 264 cash flow payment from 2020 and allow the property to retain the funds to help absorb the shortfalls. Are there, yes, Council President. Uh, Chair Favor, uh, just uh, uh, calling a question on what uh, ordinance number you're reading and, and what- Am I on the, my apologies? No, no, no problem. On, on the agenda we have 2820, which is to do with um well that i just give y'all a whole do we get a preview of something else is coming <laughs> it could be all right somebody could have flagged me down i will move on to the next ordinance sure, sure. i apologize <laughs> <laughs> all right strike that from the record can that be done uh, next we have ordinance 2820-2021 to authorize the director of the Department of Development to enter into grant agreements with Community Refugee and Immigration Services and with U.S. Together in support of the Afghan Neighbors Rental Assistance Fund to authorize an appropriation and expenditure within the Neighborhood Initiative Subfund and to declare an emergency. Okay. 
I'm going to now turn this over to my colleague, Council Member Remy. Speak thank, thank you yes. very much, Council Member Favor. I appreciate it. It is anticipated that there will be uh, 75,000 individuals nationwide who are in need of assistance. Columbus is currently committed to assisting approximately 450 people. Finding housing will be the primary challenge. We, like many other cities throughout the country, will need to do our part to provide relief to address the extraordinary, unique humanitarian crisis. And this is why City Council is establishing the Afghan Neighbors Rental Assistance Fund. Our city will be playing a vital role in providing shelter to Afghan evacuees who have come to the United States as part of Operation Allies Welcome. As of September 30th, 2021, Columbus has started to welcome Afghan nationals who have completed extensive background checks and processing at the military basis as part of the Afghan Placement Assistance Program, a newly established program by the U.S. Department of State. Columbus City Council will support the establishment of the Afghan Neighbors Rental Assistance Fund with $50,000. The funding will be divided equally between Community Refugee and Immigrant Services and us together. We have established a program in partnership with the Columbus Apartment Association, the Columbus Realtors, Chris and us together. In this partnership, participating landlords will waive any application fees, accept the background checks, the Afghan Placement Assistance Program, and provide a 12-month lease to the participants. The funding is intended to support housing costs only as a reimbursement to landlords should someone within the program default. Historically, refugees and immigrants have exceptionally low default rates, so we expect that most of the funding will remain at the end of the 12-month period. Tonight, I have asked uh, Nadia Kasvin, co-founder and director of Us Together, to share a few words on the importance of this fund and the work Us Together and Chris are doing to welcome Afghan nationals to the Columbus community. Nadia, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, President Harding, Chair Favor, uh, uh, members of the council. Uh, thank you, Council Member Rimi, for sponsoring this uh, Afghan Neighbors Rental Assistance Fund and special thanks to your team who worked out to make it happen. Uh, as a result of ending the war in Afghanistan, the U.S. government committed to bringing uh, 75,000 Afghans to safety here in the United States. And uh, many of them worked with us there, with our military and with our government. Many still at a uh, safe haven uh, military bases around the uh, around the country as they are waiting uh, for processing and security checks. As uh, both Chris and us together started uh, uh, escalating uh, our uh, preparedness and uh, uh, for welcoming uh, this uh, new uh, population we identified one of the biggest barriers, and this is access to housing. This uh, Afghan Neighbors Rental Assistance Fund will allow us to open the doors and uh, uh, give this confidence to the landlord, landlords, local landlords uh, here in Columbus to start renting to this new population. Uh, we know that uh, default rate for our new American clients is very low, uh, and we also uh, hope that majority of, or maybe all, or possibly all funds will remain uh, intact. Uh, it will allow us to access housing and uh, make sure that people have the roof over their heads so that they can start this process of resettlement and rebuilding their lives. This is truly a unique partnership and once of a kind program. And I want to thank everybody involved in creating it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Nadia. We appreciate the partnership. Um, this is really exciting to have this public-private partnership uh, working with uh, both the Columbus Association, Apartment Association and Columbus Realtors along with our partners. When the need arised and there was a problem presented, it was a great opportunity to work together to try to solve it. So excited to welcome the 450 uh, Afghan nationals who spent the past 20 years supporting our troops in the United States government and welcoming them into our community. Do any of my qu colleagues have any questions or comments? I will pass back to the chair for passage. 
Thank you, Council Member Remy. I move for passage. By voice. Clerk, please call the roll by voice. Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorans? Yes. Ms. Favor? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. Ms. Tyson? Yes. President Hardin? Yes, ordinance is passed. Thank you, that's all I have in my committees. Thank you, Madam Chair. The next committee to come before council is the Economic Development Committee, chaired by Councilman Remy. Council Member, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Council President Hart. Tonight, I have Ordinance 2589-2021 to authorize the Director of Department of Development to enter into a dual-rate jobs growth incentive agreement with BarkBox, Inc. for a term of up to five consecutive years in consideration of the company's proposed capital investment of $150,000 and creation of 400 net new full-time permanent positions with an estimated annual payroll of approximately $18,800,000 in the retention of 249 full-time employees with an estimated annual payroll of $11,879,344. The Columbus Department of Development is proposing to enter into a dual rates job growth incentive with BarkBox in an amount equal to 30% of the City of Columbus income tax withheld on the Columbus payroll of new employees, 35% of the City of Columbus income tax withheld on the Columbus payroll of new employees who also are residents of the City of Columbus at the end of each calendar year for a term of up to five consecutive years. BarkBox was launched in 2012 with a monthly themed subscription of all natural treats and clever toys. Today, the, the reach of the product serves over 1.8 million dogs every month and have expanded into new product categories and thousands of retail locations. They are the only brand that serves dogs in four key categories, fun, food, health, and home, and exclusively designs and develops every single product. So I would like to uh, in invite Hernan Geraldo, the Vice President of Customer Experience Operations with Bark BarkBox, to share a few words. Hernan, the floor is yours. Good evening, esteemed uh, council members. Uh, really, really an honor to be here with you all. Uh, it's been actually amazing to just kind of observe uh, all, all the work you all do. So. So thanks again for, for everything you do. What I can tell you about Bark in general is that um, you know we're, we found, we were founded in New York. We expanded into Columbus back in 2015, uh, and it was me at North Star Cafe in, in Short North, essentially hiring people. Uh, the first class was of 12 people. Five years later, that's that's grown to over 300. So we we have really uh, invested heavily in Columbus. We believe in the talent. Uh, we love the community here, and uh, we look forward to continuing to grow our, our presence here. Certainly appreciate that. Um, you, you also are allowed to bring dogs to work, right? That's right. That's right. It's a dream job. <laughs> and you're over there at the Gravity Proje Project, and so uh, happy to have you here in Columbus and like to see your further investment into the city. I'm going to throw it now to um, Director Stevens, and he'll talk about this one and the subsequent um, pieces of legislation all together at once. So, Director Stevens, the floor is yours. Good evening, President Hardin, Chair Ramey, members of Council. Uh, the legislation before you tonight will um, for the creation of new jobs across a variety of industries, including food service professionals, warehouse managers, maintenance technicians, software developers, logistics coordinators, and customer service associates. The six jobs incentives on Council's agenda would create, together create 1,234 jobs valued at $62 million in new payroll and retain 1,785 jobs valued at $139 million in new payroll. We're excited about BarkBox and the 400 jobs that they're adding to our community and um, appreciate all the investment all these companies are making. Thank you, Director Stevens. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Okay. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Next, I have ordinance 2658 2021 to authorize the Director of Department of Development to enter into a dual rate jobs growth incentive agreement with NetJets Inc. for a term of up to five consecutive years in consideration of the company's creation of 154 net new full time permanent positions with an estimated annual payroll of approximately $12,735,000 and retention of 1,516 existing full time jobs with an approximate annual payroll. 
payroll of $126,231,635. The Columbus Department of Development is proposing to enter into a dual rate jobs growth incentive agreement with NetJets Inc. in an amount equal to 25% of the City of Columbus income tax withheld on the Columbus payroll of new employees and 30% of the City of Columbus income tax withheld on the Columbus payroll of new employees who also reside in the City of Columbus for a term of up to five consecutive years. After more than 55 years, NetJets, backed by Berkshire Hathaway, continues to be the global leader in private aviation. Due to recent fast growth, NetJets is considering locations for a headquarters consolidation and relocation. NetJets is the world's largest private jet company offering fractional aircraft ownership, private jet leases, and private jet card programs. The company is seeking cost-effective locations to support long-term growth and talent retention and recruitment and is considering both Chicago and Columbus. NetJets is proposing to expand its operation at 4,111 Bridgeway Park, Columbus 43219. I would like to invite Bradley Farrell, the Executive Vice President of Administrative Services, to share a few words on this ordinance. Mr. Farrell, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good evening, Council President Hardin, Chair Remy, and members of the City Council. Uh, my name is Brad Farrell. I'm the Executive Vice President of Administrative Services at NetJets, and I want to start off by just saying thank you very much to you and to your staff members for all of the, the work that's gone into this process. NetJets is extremely excited about its future here in Columbus. NetJets was founded in Columbus in 1964, and since then we have experienced tremendous growth. We are the largest uh, private aviation company in the world and currently have more than 750 aircraft in our global fleet. We also have more than 6,500 employees worldwide, and that includes approximately 2,000 individuals throughout the state of Ohio and more than 1,500 in central Ohio. Uh, coming out of this global pandemic, private aviation has seen a healthy rebound. And as we continue to grow, we want to reaffirm our commitment to Columbus as the base of our operations and our headquarters. The aviation industry is a major contributor to the success of Ohio's economy. It accounts for tens of thousands of jobs and hundreds of millions of dollars in economic activity each year. And NetJets is proud to be a part of that economic engine and proud to uh, continue to call Columbus home. We support a number of local educational and charitable programs. Um, and we also support the Ohio State University's aviation studies programs, and that includes funding of scholarships, um, donation of training aircraft, and the financial support of the university's new airport terminal and aviation learning center. Combined, we know these efforts will help train and grow the pilots, the mechanics, and the other aviation workforce of tomorrow that will be critical to our continued success in central Ohio. We are proud to work with the city council, our partners at the state level, and our local communities. And coming out of this pandemic, we look forward to continued growth here in Columbus. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Appreciate your continued commitment to the city of Columbus. Do any of my question? Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments this evening? Seeing none, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor. Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Next, I have ordinance 2750 2021 to authorize the director of the Department of Development to enter into a downtown office incentive agreement with River Financial Inc., as provided in Columbus City Re Council Resolution 0088. X 2007 adopted June 4th, 2007. Based in San Francisco, California, River Financial is a client first financial institution dedicated to providing financial products and services that enable their clients to harness the transformative possibilities of Bitcoin. Founded in February 2019, River Financial set out to accelerate the adoption of Bitcoin, starting with a Bitcoin brokerage that provided high levels of liquidity, cutting edge security, and industry leading client experience initiatives. Over the course of, the, of 2019, founders Alex Leishman and Andrew Benson built the infrastructure of the company. In early 2020, the product was introduced to the public. Following the success of the brokerage product, River Financial is bringing the product and operational talent to discover and build its next product innovation, hoping to move a significant portion of back office operations to Columbus. River Financial is also considering Nashville, Tennessee, Kansas City, Missouri, and Indianapolis, Indiana for this project. 
River Financial is proposing to invest a total capital investment of approximately $292,500, which includes $77,500 related to new construction and building improvements, $5,000 in machinery and $200,000 in furniture and fixtures, $10,000 standalone computer to lease equip and occupy approximately 8,000 square feet of vacant office space at 80 East Rich Street to establish and expand its client financial and administrative operations. Additionally, River Financial will retain four, four full-time employees with an annual payroll of approximately 455000 and create 30 net new full-time permanent positions with an associated new annual payroll of approximately $2,252,500 at the proposed project site. I would like to invite Alexandra Geyser, the Director of Regulatory Affairs with River Financial, to share a few words on this ordinance. Ms. Geyser. Hi, thanks so much, and great job, it is Geyser. Um, so I'm Alexandra Geyser, I'm the Director of Regulatory Affairs at River Financial, and um, as has already been mentioned, uh, we were started in 2019. We are a rapidly growing Bitcoin-only brokerage and custody service. We've also recently launched into River Mining to make um, Bitcoin mining more accessible to individuals and we are um, experiencing rapid growth and we'd like to see more of it happening in Ohio. So, so far we've raised um, over $25 million. We've got $400 million in assets under custody and we are looking to put our strategic operations center in Columbus for a number of reasons, not the least of which is we have many Ohio State grads on staff uh, and frankly, they'd much rather live in Columbus than in San Francisco. Um, so we would, um, we love Columbus, we love Ohio, um, but you know, if, if this falls through, we might look at other places in the Midwest. Um, my husband is an Ohio native, so he is personally pulling uh, for Columbus. Thank you so much, Ms. Geyser. We appreciate your commitment to the city of Columbus. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Next, I have Ordinance 2751 2021 to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into a dual rates job growth incentive agreement with SK Food Group, Inc. for a term of up to five consecutive years in consideration of the company's creation of 305 new net new full time permanent positions with an estimated cumulative annual payroll of approximately $12,389,296. The Columbus Department of Development is proposing to enter into a dual rates job growth incentive agreement with SK Foods Inc. in an amount equal to 30% of the City of Columbus income tax withheld on the Columbus payroll of new employees and 35% of the City of Columbus income tax withheld on the Columbus payroll of new employees who also are residents of the City of Columbus. SK Food Group is a custom food manufacturing company serving customers across North America. From product creation to flawless execution and assembly, SK Food Group is a hands-on partner every step of the way. The company is the leading producer of handcraft sandwiches, wraps, protein snacks, flatbreads, burgers, and more for a wide range of customers serving Fortune 500 companies like Starbucks, along with airlines and retailers. Columbus is competing with Reno, Nevada, and Phoenix, Arizona for this project. SK Group is proposing to enter into a long-term lease agreement on a vacant industrial warehouse facility consisting of approximately 144,000 square feet at 2955 to 3,035 Charter Street in Columbus to establish a new operations to support its increased sales growth and customer demands. Additionally, SK Food proposes to invest approximately 10 million in leasehold improvements, 8 million in machinery and equipment, and create 305 net new full-time positions with estimated cumulative annual payroll of $12,389,296. Um, I would like to invite Dan Barton, the Executive Vice President and Chief Operations Officer of SK Food Group to share a few words on this ordinance. Mr. Barton, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Ramey. I, uh, I couldn't be more thankful for you guys making time for me to discuss this opportunity with, with the council. Um, as mentioned, I'm Chief Operating Officer of uh, SK Food Group, uh, food manufacturing and assembly uh, manufacturing uh, across eight plants in the United States and Canada. 
We've been operating in the Columbus market for over seven years, employing over 600 people uh, with a $25 million a year payroll. Uh, we've had an unbelievable experience with not only the community in Columbus, but uh, you know, one Columbus and, and all of our interactions with the city. And so we've been really excited about the opportunity as we looked at expanding um, uh, across our opportunities in, in, in central Ohio, as well as uh, remainder of the, of the United States, the opportunity to grow our footprint in Ohio just seemed to make uh, incredible sense. And so uh, this uh, job growth incentive has been unbelievably attractive to us with the opportunity to again, employ over 300 more additional employees in the, in the Columbus market invest over $20 million, we believe, in, in capital over the next year and a half. Uh, looking forward to a potential innovation center as well as further use, utilizing this investment as a catalyst for further investment in the Columbus market. Um, you know, as I close, I'd like to share, you know, uh, something that makes SK unique in our purpose is that, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time focusing on how we improve food insecurity in the communities that we operate, um, as well as ensuring that our employees are given the opportunity to reach their full potential. So uh, not only that uh, are the investments on the business side, but on our stewardship in the communities that we operate. And I will share that I reside in the, in the Columbus market. And so I am personally vested in the success of, of these investments we make in the community. Thank you very much, Mr. Barton. We appreciate your commitment to Columbus and, and investing in the community as well. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. To, um, next, I have ordinance 2752-2021 to authorize the Director of Development to enter into a dual rates job growth incentive agreement with Hollingsworth Logistics Group doing business as Hollingsworth LLC and Hollingsworth Management Services for a term of up to five consecutive years in consideration of the company's proposed capital investment of $850,000 in the creation of 95 net new full-time permanent positions with an estimated annual payroll of approximately $3,302,140. In the retention of 16 full-time permanent positions with an estimated payroll of 700,000. The Columbus Department of De Development is proposing to enter into a dual rates job growth in incentive agreement with Hollingsworth in an amount equal to 25% of the City of Columbus's income tax withheld on the Columbus payroll of new employees and 30% of the City of Columbus income tax withheld on the Columbus payroll of new employees who also are residents of the City of Columbus. They're headquartered in Dearborn, Michigan. Hollingsworth is a Native American owned and operated third party logistics supply chain innovator. Hollingsworth history dates back to 1925 when the company E.L. Hollingsworth was first founded in Flint as one of the world's first expediters of automotive parts. Through a series of mergers beginning in 91, the company broadened its service capabilities and became nationally recognized as a carry, carried minority business under the name Hollingsworth. The company is proud to be a mino, minority owned business and even more proud that over 75% of their workforce are minorities. Hollingsworth Management Services LLC is a subsidiary of Hollingsworth and is the company's third party employer. Hollingsworth Excuse me, Hollingsworth is proposing to invest a total project cost of approximately 850000 in machinery and equipment to expand its operations at 2450 Spiegel Drive. Additionally, Hollingsworth will retain 16 full-time permanent positions with an associated annual payroll of 700000 and create 95 net new full-time positions with a cumulative estimated annual payroll of $3,302,140 to support its increased sales goal and consumer demands. I would like to invite Julie Worth General Counsel with Hollingsworth to share a few words. Ms. Worthman. Thank you, Chair Remy, and thank you, Council members, for inviting me to speak tonight. We are uh, very excited to continue our expansion in the Columbus market. We've been in Columbus for a little over 10 years now, uh, starting with one facility that grew to about a million square feet in, um, in Columbus. We added a second facility in Columbus about a year and a half ago, and that's allowing us to expand rapidly in the Columbus market. Um, 
as uh, Chair Remy said, we are adding about 95 employees to that facility. And the great news is that with this new project, that facility is at capacity and we are actively looking for a third facility uh, to go into the Columbus market sometime in the next six months, which should employ an additional 200 people. So we're really excited about Columbus. We are very grateful for the relationship that we have with the city and um, all of the support that the city has given us and really excited to be here and um, introducing our company to the city council and letting you know um, who we are. So thank you so much and um, appreciate the time. Thank you, Ms. Worthman. We certainly appreciate the investment. Look forward to your future expansion. Um, are there any questions in, or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Next, I have Ordinance 2806-2021 to authorize the Director of Development, Department of Development to amend and restate the City of Columbus Jobs Growth Incentive Agreement with Upstart Network, Inc. for the purposes of to add Trinet Group, Inc., doing business as Trinet, as additional grantee to the agreement to revise the proposed job creation goal from 100 new full-time permanent positions with an annual payroll of approximately $10.75 million to 350 net new full-time permanent positions with an associated annual payroll of approximately $23,389,500 to revise the incentive agreement of the the to revise the incentive term of the agreement from five consecutive years to six consecutive years, to add 800 North High Street um, as an additional location to the project site, and that the amended and restated agreement would follow the full format of the city's current City of Columbus Jobs Growth Incentive Agreement and to declare an emergency. Do my clients, do my colleagues have any um, questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Dorn's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. And that's all I have in economic development. May I move on to the Environment Committee? Sure. Thank you very much. Tonight I have ordinance number 2865 2021 to authorize a transfer of a million dollars within the Refuse General Fund to authorize the Director of Finance and Management to establish purchase orders and associate relevant purchase agreements with multiple vendors for the purchase of refuse collection containers and parts to authorize the expenditure of up to $1 million for the Refuse General Fund for the purchase of these containers and parts to authorize the purchase of more than 100000 from an individual universal term contract established for the purchase of refuse container and parts and to declare an emergency. The Department of Public Service Division of Refuse Collection utilizes 96 gallon, 300 gallon and other types as needed in its mechanized collection system for residential tra trash collection. The division also requires replacement parts for containers that are not covered by warranties. The purchasing office has completed bidding or has established universal term contracts for the purchase of these commodities. This legislation authorizes the Director of Finance and Management to establish purchase orders for the Division of Refuse Collection from established universal term contracts or completed bids. This legislation author also authorizes the Finance and Management Director to associate all general budget reservations resulting from this ordinance with the cur following current, pending, and future universal term contract purchase agreements for refuse containers for the Division of Refuse Collection. Do my client, do my colleagues have any questions or comments this evening? I can't speak anymore. Seeing that, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the row. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Passed. And that is all I have in environment this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Final committee to come before council is the Health and Human Services Committee. That committee is chaired by Councilmember Tyson. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, President Harden. I have ordinance number 2921-2021 to authorize the Director of Department of Development um, to enter into a, a grant agreement with young, the Young Women's Christian Association, known as the YWCA Columbus, in amount up to $957,337 using Federal American Rescue Plan Act funds to provide operational support to mitigate financial hardships, to implement COVID-19 prevention and mitigation tactics, to provide premium pay for essential workers and to pay for expenses starting March the 3rd of 2021, to modify the terms and conditions of the grant agreement as needed without seeking further 
council approval in order to align with the most current version of the laws, regulations, and guidance to authorize expenditure up to $957,337 of the ARPA funds and to declare an emergency. Uh, the YMCA of Columbus provides emergency shelter and wraparound services to homeless individuals. Um, at the shelter, staff have worked directly in person with people experiencing a housing crisis throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. They, they have risked the health and well-being of themselves and their families to keep our neighbors, our neighbors experiencing homelessness safe. As an essential worker in the city's critical infrastructure to address the housing crisis, frontline staff are eligible for premium pay under the ARPA guidelines. Um, this legislation I'm gonna, was also passed. Other legislation that's similar to this was passed on consent this evening um, to address, again, these same issues mm -hmm. of personal expenses, operations, and facility needs due to COVID-19. Faith Mission um, in the amount of 296 351 Mary Haven in the amount of 23125 and Southeast Inc., um, up to 61, these are all up to $61,863. Director um, Stevens, can you um, please share why there is, um, share the potential grant agreement modifications without coming back to council? Yes, thank you, uh, President Hardin, Chair Tyson, members of council. We included that language because the guidance from the U.S. Treasury has been, I would say, fluid. Uh, and changing um, on, on a regular basis. So we wanted to limit the number of administrative amendments that we brought back to city council, as well as make sure that we are um, following the law and getting these dollars out as quickly as possible to our providers and our partners. Thank you, Director Stevens. Are there any questions for Director Stevens? Seeing none, any questions for me? Seeing none, I move for passage. <laughs> Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, okay. Brown, Doran's favor. Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Pass. Thank you. That concludes the uh, Health and Human Services agenda this evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one note uh, before ending council. I um, want to take a moment to recognize uh, our deputy clerk. Um, this is her last meeting, and I would say the deputy clerk has been holding uh, council down uh, for uh, longer than most members have been here, I think, except for Council Member Tyson. Um, certainly longer than I have been here. And uh, you're going to be a uh, clerk of Hudson, City of Hudson. Uh, we are very proud of you. We're sad to see you leave, but just want to say thank you so much for, for keeping us together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thank you. This is. Be, I know we're trying to all leave, but Parna, I just really want to thank you for your service. I certainly remember when you first started working here, working with Councilmember Miller, and um, and that you transitioned from Councilmember Miller into the clerk's office. And um, certainly, since you've been here, you've had your children, you know, et cetera. But just really has been. Um, you've been someone who has been quietly, quietly. Um, getting this job done and with professionalism we've never had to worry about you know in the clerk's office with so we have an amazing clerk clerk Blevins but certainly her whole team but you have certainly came into that role and have just expanded it and um, continue to make all of us look really good out here on this floor yes. with the work that you do so congratulations to you and your family as you move to this next phase and the city of Hudson will certainly be a better place because of you. So thank you so much. Well, with that, uh, seeing no further business uh, to come before council, and I think we have four non-agenda speakers. <laughs> Just joking. Claire, uh, is there a motion to adjourn? Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor. Remy Tyson, President Hardin. Adjourn.